Welcome back to another stream. Hi, how is everyone doing? It is Thursday night here in Malaysia and it has just rained, so the weather is a little bit chilly here. And wow, it has been quite an adventurous week for me. Uh, the past week, I just came back from Kuching, my hometown, and I did a live stream after that. And in the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I went to Ipoh, which was about two and a half hours drive north from Kuala Lumpur. I was with a group of friends. It was a lot of shuttle therapy adventures. We ate a lot of good food. And yeah, we, we had a lot of good time. But uh, something happened. Uh, the camera that I was using, I'm not gonna tell you what camera, on Saturday, it was fine. On Sunday, it died. <laughs> like I said, it was quite an adventure. I'm not going to tell you which camera that died. Uh, I will review it in one of my coming videos. Not in December though, it will sometime be in early January. So I made a video to talk about that camera, which I actually quite enjoyed using it while it was still alive. And then it just decided to give up on me. So yeah, quite an experience, hey. And um, of course, uh, coming back to Kompor, I had some shoots going on. I have some people to meet. I still made a video which I published on Monday. Uh, yeah, if you have, haven't seen the video, please, please, please do check it out. And I think it was about the 1454 lens uh, on my OM1 camera, which I was talking about this first for third DSLR lens, uh, which I think is still pretty amazing if you ask me. <laughs> All right, uh, today's topic is quite straightforward. It is more on four thirds DSLR. And you know, it's more like, hey, DS uh, four thirds has been around for quite some time. Olympus, Panasonic, and quite a few, a lot of other companies came together and formed this new fully digital format. And although four thirds format didn't last forever, I think uh, sometime after the EM, uh, sorry, 20, 2013, yeah. After that, uh, Olympus has officially discontinued the four thirds DSR system. It may not have lasted for very, very long, but I still think that it's quite an interesting system. And four thirds DSLR has contributed a lot to the imaging industry, to the development of technologies and camera innovation. There are certain features that started in four thirds cameras, and I want to explore these features. I want to talk about them. I want to celebrate the amazing four thirds system while it lasted. And a lot of these things trickle down to a lot of cameras that we have today in our micro four thirds system. Not only that, a lot of these features or whatever that the four thirds DSLR came up with, the innovation and technology, they were also copied by a lot of other brands and other cameras out there. So let's say hi to some people first. Van, hey, how are you? <laughs> we should really catch up. Hey, Van, one of these weekends, we should go maka maka and maybe do some vlogging or shooting. It'll be really, really fun. I miss you guys, Van. Thanks for dropping by. Nice to see you. Brian, very, very nice to see you. How are you, man? Brian says, hi, Robin. Nice to see you again, especially after a long day at work for me. No worries. Glad to be seen and glad to go live here. Terry says, hi Robin, hope you're well from the cold, wet UK. Hey Terry, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for dropping by. Oh, by the way, I haven't asked, is my audio okay? Because I uh, was in a rush. I came home from somewhere and I just did a very quick setup. This time I did not have much time to test. So I hope the audio is okay. Is it too loud or too soft? Let me know. I'll make some micro adjustments. I hope everything is okay. I This was a very last minute setup. I usually will prepare. Well... Believe it or not, it took me about one hour to set up before I go live. And the last five to 10 minutes, I just stare at the screen and prepare what I want to say. But basically I have to set up the light, the camera, the microphone, test the software, uh, make sure everything is okay. You know, and that actually took some time, right? All right, Corey. Corey says, hello for Indiana, USA. Hey Corey, nice to see you again. Thanks for dropping by. HR Manro, hey, very nice to see you. Hesha Manro says, hello from Isle of Wight, UK, raining and cold here. I can't add to the conversation as I never had Four Thirds kit, just Micro Four Thirds. However, the predecessor of Micro Four Thirds, Four Thirds must have had impact, yes. There are a lot of impacts that the Four Thirds has uh, contributed, not just for Micro Four Thirds, but for overall photography industry. And I want to explore that in this video. 
Robert says, Hi Robin and fellow photography enthusiasts. Hey Robert, how are you? Nice to see you here. Furi Serafin, hey! Hello, you're early today, it seems. Not early, I think it's the same, right? It's 9 o'clock in Malaysia, so uh, I have been consistently going live every Thursday, Malaysia time. 9 o'clock uh, for the past two months now. I think I have like 8 or 9 live streams live uh, available for you to rewatch, and they're all about the same time. John Yazi says, Hello Robin, everyone from Ohio, USA. The great season is here. <laughs> hey John, how are you? And nice to see you here. Hope you're doing well, John. Vermis says, Hello, hey Vermis, how are you? Nice to see you here. Zoltan, hi. <laughs> how are you, Zoltan? Very, very happy to see you here, Zoltan. Nina Shields says, Greetings from Atlanta. Hey Nina, very nice to see you again. Nina says, audio is great. Thanks for the confirmation. Happy to hear that. Elvin says, hello. Hey, Elvin. Nice to see you. Terry says, audio is perfect. Thank you. Thanks for the confirmation. And Tom, Tom says, greetings from New England in the USA. Hey, Tom. How are you? Now, before I jump into the topic, let's sip some coffee. Uh, I'm going to show off my Canon L lens mark. Ah, just got to get in focus. Well, technically, it's not Canon. I don't know if you can see. It's Khan. Kanyao, <laughs> whatever that is, but coffee is good. Hmm. Ah, yes, coffee is life. So, a little bit of history about myself first. My first ever DSLR was the Olympus E410. All right, but before that, uh, I had a Kodak compact camera. Actually, I had three. I killed, two. I killed all of them. I had three Kodak point-and-shoot digital cameras, and I loved using them, but they were point-and-shoot, and they were very basic. There's nothing much you can do. And as my compact cameras have died, I came back to Kuala Lumpur. So I was in Australia at that time, studying engineering. And after I've graduated, I worked for a year in Australia, and then I came back to Kuala Lumpur. And my Kodak camera died, so I needed a new camera. So I was looking at DSLRs, and the reason I went for Olympus, the four thirds DSLR system, was because it was the cheapest. The entry level that time, the E410, uh, in Ringgit, Malaysia, it was selling for less than 2000. It was selling for like 1008, 1009 with the kit lens. Whereas the Canon and Nikon, I think the Canon was 400D. The naming might be different if you're in America or some other parts of the world. And then the Nikon uh, D40X, right? Both Canon 400D and Nikon D40X, they were selling for about 2,500 ringgit. That's about 20% of price difference. As a graduate, I did not have a lot of money, so I was very budget conscious and I, I told myself, hey, I'm just learning photography anyway. I wasn't very good at it. I was still very new. So that's why I bought the cheapest option available at that time, which was the Olympus uh, E410. The E410 didn't last very long. I only used it for, I think, if I'm not mistaken, about three months. And then it was stolen from me. So I was in a train coming home from a friend's graduation. I shot my friend's, uh, friend's convocation photographs. And um, in the train, it was very busy. I think there were a few people. And my E410 with the Olympus 25 f2.8 pancake, they were robbed, they were ripped from me. All right? And I didn't even realize it happened. It happened so quickly. And by the time I, I realized it was too late. Anyways, I, I wasn't sad or anything. Things happen like that in Malaysia all the time. So anyways, uh, I moved on. A few months later, I save up and I bought the Olympus E520. I still have my E520. I think it is still a little bit alive. I should be bringing this out to do some shutter therapy. So this is my E520, which I've been using since the year 2008. So yeah, it's pretty much uh, still alive. All right, this, this is the camera that I learned everything about photography. Uh, I learned my shutter speed, aperture, I learned about bokeh, I learned about focusing, I learned about flash, I learned about everything. Uh, and I did my shutter therapy. I went out and shoot almost every weekend. So that time I had a full-time job, I was an engineer. So I only went out to shoot in the weekends. Uh, that's why, and I have a blog where I share new photographs every single week uh, while I share my adventures, uh, what I've learned, the challenges that I've faced. And of course, over time, from 2008, 2009, the blog grew and I was the only one in Malaysia to write about photography and use Olympus. I was the only one, right? And I was the only, the only few in the world to actively blog about Olympus right? and constantly share fresh content. And this was before Instagram. This was way before Instagram and it was the 
early days of YouTube, right? Uh, but I didn't have YouTube back then. And then after that, in 2010, if I'm not wrong, or 2011, I was noticed by Olympus Malaysia, and that's where they asked me to review this Olympus E5. I think this was the best for thirds camera uh, from Olympus or yeah, this is the best four-thirds DSLR ever. It's just so awesome. The build quality, the image quality at that time was really good. The focusing was really fast. It has image stabilization. It was weather sealed. And a lot of this, whatever you find in this E5, you can find the OMD cameras now in Micro Four Thirds system released by Olympus and OM system. There was a brief history of uh, how I got involved with uh, Olympus and DSL, the four-thirds DSLR system. And I loved it. I loved it from the start. I have friends using Canon and Nikon with me all the time. I have friends using APS-C DSLR, full frame DSLRs. I never felt threatened. I've always been happy with what I have. When I shot and I look at my photographs, I was always very satisfied. That's why I share my passion. I share my joy. I share my photographs week after week for many, many years. And it has been like 20 years since I started blogging. And most of these posts, they are still up there. You can find my photographs from my early days. And yeah, it, was, it has been really, really fun using the Four Thirds DSLR. Of course, um, Micro Four Thirds was launched and then EM1 came along and when the EM1 was was available, I thought, hey, it's time to switch on because autofocus was way faster. It has the electronic viewfinder, which helped me for my professional shoots. What you see is what you get. And of course, I want everything to be smaller and lighter. The years of me using a DSLR, especially doing paid shoots, uh, I was doing shooting weddings. So it's like a full day carrying a camera around. I developed some back problem. Sometimes my shoulder and my back, it still hurts from those days. So whenever I can go smaller and lighter, I took the chance immediately. That was a brief history of my involvement with Four Thirds. Uh, let's read some comments before I share what are the technologies or innovation in all this Four Thirds DSLR, which was ported over Micro Four Thirds and which was also copied by everyone in the industry. <laughs> there are quite a few. Let's look at the comments first. Stewart says, hi all. Hey Stewart, how are you? This side to a screen says, Hi Robin from Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, how are you? Very nice to see you again. Stuart says, I started with the Canon 400D. I think the Canon 400D is a fantastic camera. It was about the same time as I did. So it was launched together with the Olympus E400 or 410. Of course, the Olympus is cheaper, so I got the Olympus instead. This side to a screen said, first DSLR was a Pentax K10D. Camera lasted 14 years before I retired to get a bit of a newer camera. Yeah, I think Pentax makes amazing DSLRs as well. They have some of the best DSLRs around. Steve says, greetings from Florida. Hey Steve, how are you? Very nice to see you here. Huri Serafin says, I so wish I had my Kodak 5 million megapixel camera I bought 20 years ago to spend time with who is my wife in Ecuador. Yeah, I think Kodak did have some like, was it DC, DCS1 or something? They had some really cool DSLRs back then. And in terms of technology, I think at that time before Kodak just disappeared, from the map, right? Uh, they were actually ahead in terms of digital photography technology. They were holding back. I think they, they thought that they wanted to squeeze as much as they can from the film business, from the printing business, right? But they didn't know that everyone else, like Canon, Nikon, Olympus, everyone caught up so fast. The digital uh, revolution came so quickly that they did not have the chance to actually do whatever they needed to do in the digital world and lose out to everyone, right? <laughs> Elvin says, I started shooting film in 1962. Oh, cool. Well, I started shooting digital in 2000 and what? Let me think, five? <laughs> John Yazi says, Robin, you first came to my attention when you were doing things with Ming Tian. So I was with Olympus. I worked for Olympus from 2013. So, okay, there's a disconnect here. So I reviewed this E5. Of course, I got the attention of Olympus and somehow my review uh, became quite successful. It, it gained quite a lot of attention uh, from DP review forums, from uh, people are discussing about my reviews everywhere. It, it became quite a hit, right? I received like 50,000 uh, views on that blog article per day. So that was, that was quite something. So I was noticed by Olympus Malaysia and eventually they hired me in 2013. And I worked for them for four years. And in 2017, I quit. 
And it was in that year after I quit, I met up with Ming Tian and he said, hey, why don't you, why don't we join forces? Like, why don't you contribute to my site? And I wrote for in, on Ming Tian's site for I think about one or two years. And I've contrib contributed quite a lot of articles there. So yeah, that's when John uh, actually noticed me. It's too bad though Ming Tian doesn't uh, do photography much anymore. He's just doing personal photography. He has stopped uh, his professional photography business. He's making watches now. Corey says, I started getting deep into photography with the Nikon 1 series camera. Amazing. I, have, I still have the Nikon 1 J1. Before that, my only experience with photography was an old Pentax K10D. I think the Pentax is still quite an awesome camera. Henry Ma says, hello from Hong Kong. Hey Henry, how are you? Thanks for dropping by. Steve H says, the G9 Mark II is tempting. Ah, go get it. Why don't you get it? MD says, I've started with Canon 20D. Wow, that's even dating way back. Yeah, the earlier days of the SLR. I have no experience with Canon 20D though. Henry says, I was using Canon 10D. Good old days with 6 megapixel CMOS sensor. Wow, you guys are from the earlier days. 10D, 20D, yeah. All right, yes, just like the E1, you're right. Steve says, uh, my first camera was the G95 and I love it. Micro Four Thirds can be addictive, yes. I think Micro Four Thirds makes photography a lot more accessible to everyone. And there are cameras that are affordable and they are very small, very light. It's so easy to just bring around with you everywhere, right? That's when things really happen. John says, hello Robin and everyone from a cold, wet UK. Hey John, thanks for dropping by. Very nice to see you. Viper6 says, love your channel. Greeting from Canada. Hey Viper, thank you so much for being here and thanks for letting me know that you love the channel. I thank you for your support and hey, like I said, there's no Robin Wong without you guys. So thank you, thank you so much Viper. Canis Lupus says, hello. Hey Canis, how are you? Hello from Russia. Wow, that is very far away. <laughs> I imagine it's very cold there. Lizzie says, I started with the Lumix GF1. Yes, I think a lot of you here start with the Micro Four Thirds, right? GF1 is Micro Four Thirds, but there is like a whole world of Four Thirds before that. <laughs> now, there are a few things that this uh, Four Thirds DSLR did right. I'm just gonna open up the mount. Uh, so let's just show you this, this Four Thirds mount, right? This, if the camera can get it to focus, yep. And to pair it, we have an all new Four Thirds lens, of course, at that time it was new, now it's old. And this is a Four Thirds lens, just gotta get it to focus. And this is a new mount, uh, it's Four Thirds mount. Uh, of course, this, uh, let me just put this away. All right, so now if you can see this Olympus, if you can focus, Olympus Digital, all right. And it's a Zuiko Digital. And this digital mount, it has something which they call telecentric optical design. I don't think Olympus invented telecentric optical design. I think this particular technique or this optical design has been around for a while, used by other applications. But uh, Olympus was the first to introduce telecentric optical design in consumer uh, imaging products. And the first consumer camera that has this telecentric optical design was this uh, Four Thirds cameras released by Olympus and Panasonic. And the first camera and the first lens to have this design is this E1. This DSLR E1, this is the first Four Thirds camera. And of course, the first DSLR lens that was launched together with this E1 was this Zuko Digital 1454 f2.8 to 3.5. Both these adopted telecentric design. So what is telecentric design? It basically means that the light hits the sensor as perpendicularly as possible yeah, I should have a graphic to show, but I have no time to prepare beforehand. So you just have to imagine, like you, you watch my video on Monday. So the light hits the sensor as perpendicularly as possible to have an optimized uh, light gathering capabilities. So images coming out from Four Thirds, uh, Olympus or claim, or the Four Thirds claim that it's superior than traditional full frame because it's designed from ground up, from blank slate, and it, is, it has telecentric design where the light goes all the way to the corners and the corners are sharp and the sharpness is not, not just we have corner sharpness, we have less vignetting, but the image quality across, even at the center of the frame, is fully, fully optimized. And this lens, uh, I, I talk about this on Monday's video, it's amazing. It's so optimized that 
at this time, this was 20 years ago in 2003 when E1 was launched with this lens, there was no software correction. Meaning that the lens itself, the elements, the glass that's used in this lens has to correct all the technical flaws, including distortion, vignetting, chromatic aberration, flare, everything, right? Things like chromatic aberration and distortion, which can be corrected in software, which, uh, which is used by a lot of modern cameras to overcorrect, I think. <laughs> but in this lens and this camera, there was no such thing as software correction. So the lens uh, optical formula was actually very, very impressive for it to, to be able to, to correct all these problems and still deliver very sharp images. And I've just tested the, the 1454 on OM1. Uh, it's my latest video please watch it if you have not done so on Monday and man the images that come up from it is super sharp this telecentric design was introduced by Olympus it was used in four thirds format in the year 2003 of course, when uh, Micro Four Thirds was launched in 2008, which was five years, five, six years later, the same telecentric optic design was also, also ported over to Micro Four Thirds, and we enjoy the benefits of this telecentric design today. We have very optimized output, we have sharp images from corner to corner, and the images that look so good, it's optimized for digital sensor, right? And guess what? Canon and Nikon, also copied this telecentric design in their mirrorless full-frame cameras when Canon went to the R system, they, they went mirrorless full-frame, the R5, R6, as they launched the camera. Uh, I think the first one was EOS R. Uh, they used the telecentric design. When Nikon also moved to full-frame mirrorless, uh, the Nikon Z system, or the, the first camera was, I think, Z6 and Z7, they also adopted the telecentric design. You can look at the lens and how they move the lens closer to the sensor, and how they designed the light so that it hits the sensor more perpendicularly. They basically adopted similar lens design. Another thing about telecentric design is to make the mount a lot larger than needed, right? You can see that this mount is actually very large, whereas the sensor inside is actually very small, right? So the, the mount itself is much larger than necessary. And that's what Nikon and Canon are also doing. Uh, yeah, there was, I, I thought there was quite an interesting fact, uh, it was a nugget of information where we fo micro four thirds shooters should be very proud because four thirds came up with this. They didn't invent the technology. I think they just adopted the design. They, they had the foresight to see that this will be beneficial. This is the way to move forward. And this is the right way to make lenses. And this is the best possible way to get the best quality optical design to optimize whatever best uh, pixel that we can get from the image sensor. And they've adopted this in the year 2003. And in the year 20, 2018, 2019, that's when uh, Canon and Nikon uh, started to, to release their full-frame mirrorless with the same telecentric design. <laughs> what do you guys think uh, of this telecentric design? Are you guys aware of this fact? or this, Is this the first time you hear about this? Let me know. I'm going to go to the comments now. Peter Thiel says, hi from Germany. Hey Peter, how are you? Uh, I started with an OM10 nearly 40 years ago. Wow, that's a long time ago. Nowadays, I use the EM1 Mark III and the Lumix G9. Both are excellent, excellent cameras. Brian says, when you adapted four thirds to micro four thirds, does it have any drawback? Slow autofocus only work for certain four thirds lens only. I will highly suggest that you find cameras from Micro Four Thirds that has phase detection autofocus. For example, uh, EM1, EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III, uh, EM1 X or EM5 Mark III, and of course the OM1. And currently, if you want to use a Panasonic Micro Four Thirds body, the only body with uh, phase detection autofocus now, as of now, is the G9 Mark two all right with the face detection of focus um, then the focusing will be slightly faster than on the other cameras or micro photos that doesn't have face detection face is in phase and uh, i've tested this uh, 1454 lens this particular lens on my om1 camera and somehow i feel that the om1's face detection uh, or the focus uh, the the sensor is actually much more effective in comparison to EM1 Mark III or EM1 Mark II. And I'm more confident using this older 4 thirds lens on OM1 versus 
any other previous Micro Four Thirds cameras. I think the OM1's face detection auto focus is a lot more efficient and effective in handling older DSLRs. At least that's my finding. All right, so I hope that helps uh, your, with whatever that you're asking, Brian. Christopher says, hi Robin from France. Hey Christopher, how are you? I got the EMR Mark III finally. Congratulations, I hope you like the camera. Just got the 40 to 150 Pro. And wow, watching all your video to self-train myself. Thank you, let's do this. Yes, let's do this. <laughs> I'm gonna drink some coffee. Mm. Ah. Right, uh, GRT says, Love your content. Thank you so much, GRT, and thanks for being here. Kainese Lupus says, Olympus E400, my camera, plus cameras, four Micro Four Thirds cameras. Wow, that is a lot of Micro Four Thirds cameras. Yeah, E400 is so amazing here. I think at that time, it was the world's smallest uh, DSLR, and it was quite cool. Uh, Kanye says E1 is super, yes. I personally still love this E1. I have one video about this E1 coming up. So basically, um, I never owned this 14 to 54 lens and I only got it recently. I found one in the used market and I look at the condition. It's still very, very good, right? And the reason I bought this lens is so that I can use it on my uh, Olympus E1 DSLR. I want to use this DSLR more. And I think this lens uh, fits this camera really well. After all, it was designed to be launched together with this E1. So this pairing, I think, is just fantastic. And I have actually gone out and uh, did some street shooting with this combination. And I can't wait to share with you guys the new video and my thoughts about this uh, E1. And uh, I was using it in the year 2023. And how is this camera holding up? Is 5 megapixels enough? And you know, uh, all the things that I like and dislike about the camera, I'm going to share it very, very soon. So yeah, keep an eye out for that video. Just me says five. Hi there, is Olympus OMD Mark IV still worth it now? OMD EM1, EM, EM10, EM10. I think there's EM10 Mark IV. I think it is. Depends on what you want to do. Uh, the EM10 series they are designed to be used uh, to be beginner friendly. So if you're a newcomer to photography and or you want to step up from your smartphone, you want something more serious, you want to change lens, uh, I think the EM10 series cameras is is worth uh, having a look at because it has built-in electronic viewfinder, it has powerful image stabilization, it has tilt screen, and image quality is also very, very good. Uh, the only thing you are missing out, not the only thing, but there are some big things that are missing out is it's not uh, weather sealed, so don't shoot in the rain. Uh, it's not magnesium alloy body, so it's not as rugged as the EM1 series cameras. It doesn't have dual cut slots. It's, it only has single cut slots, so, prof so prof for professional shoots, man. Tongue tight there. For professional shoots, uh, an EM1 series is more suitable. And the battery do doesn't last very long. And the Etronic Viewfinder is not as good as the ones that's found in the EM1 series cameras. But other than that, uh, it's still a fantastic camera, especially if you are new to photography. Bernard says, hello from France. France, hey Bernard, how are you? Just meet. You gotta wait, hey, <laughs> gotta be patient. If you have noticed, guys, I reply to every single question. I don't skip anyone, right? I go through every single one. So if I haven't come to your question, all you have to do is just wait, right? It'll be another maybe 5-10 minutes, I'll get back to you. So please, there is uh, 71 people here and I think a lot of people are asking questions. So I will get to everyone, just give me time, right? Entrick, oh, hey Entrick, how are you? Nice to see you here. Hello from Washington, D.C. I hope you're doing well, Entrick. Santix, hey, how is Kajang? Is Kajang raining? Uh, Bukit Jala has just stopped raining. Hello from RRT and MRT train. Oh, so you're heading back to Kajang, I assume? You just came back from work? John Thomas uh, is talking to Christ Christopher Nash. I have the 40-150 f2.8 lens on EM1 Mark III. I use this for all my fungi uh, macro shots. Yeah, fantastic combination. John Yazi says, I knew that Olympus lenses had a different design with perpendicular light transmission. Just didn't know it had a name, telecentric. Now I know, yes, it's telecentric optical design. Well, technically they didn't invent it. It was, I think someone else had this technology already, but they were the first to use it uh, in the consumer imaging market, right? 
yeah, it would be wrong to assume that Olympus invented this technology that did not. Santik says, four thirds, the impact is making an established system where small manufacturers can focus on making the product where the platform is already there. Hmm, I think you are talking about micro four thirds. Uh, yes, four thirds philosophy has always been making smaller products, but then again, they are also not like they, they, the big players are only Olympus and Panasonic, right? At that time, this was like way back in the DSLR days. Uh, yeah, I think the more impact is in the micro photo this time where you, we have more and more other manufacturers coming in like Yongnuo, Sigma and other people. Satik says, lens interchangeable between brands, making lenses for wider use. That's micro four thirds. That's not four thirds. Yeah. Stewart says, I'm eyeing up an upgrade for next year. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> you have plenty of time. And yes, Santik says, going back to Kajang, office day tomorrow, work from home tomorrow. Oh, office day today, work from home tomorrow. That's nice. You get to work from home on Fridays. Hmm. All right. Now, the optical design was not the only thing that uh, for thirds introduced to the market, right? Of obviously now everyone is adopting the telecentric design, the modern full frame uh, lenses from Canon Nikon, Nikon Z system and Canon RF lenses, they are all using telecentric optical design. Now another thing which E1 introduced, it was like the first ever in any camera, right? E1, so this camera, the first thing that was introduced in this camera that other people never had at the time was in sensor dust cleaning. All right, so it has the supersonic wave, uh, supersonic wave filter SSWF. So with that supersonic wave filter SSWF, Olympus implemented self sensor cleaning. I hope you didn't hear the police siren on the highway. <laughs> Sorry about the noise. Yes, the self sensor cleaning where if you have like dust on the sensor, every time you turn on the camera, it vibrates. And as it vibrates, it can clean off the sensor and there's like a gutter at the bottom of the sensor to collect for all the, for all the dust or any particles to drop, it collects at the gutter. And it was game changing because any cameras before that, even full frame cameras like Canon 5D, uh, Nikon D2, or D700 before that, right? Uh, wait, yeah, they all didn't have self-cleaning sensor, right? So dust will be collected on sensor and after a while you get all these spots if you're shooting against a plane surface, like shooting against the sky. If you shoot at f5.6, f8, you see all these ugly dots and you have to like manually remove them. We don't have smart software back then. We don't have AI to help with all this uh, dust removal. So you have to manually spot remove the dust one by one. And it can be a hassle for working photographers. So at that time, you can imagine suddenly this camera introduces the uh, sensor self-cleaning and it was like wow it's a miracle we don't have to send a camera for service too often anymore unless there's something really serious of course it doesn't remove all dust right it remove most dust most of the time maybe just left like a few uh, particles which can be easily clean versus like you have like dozens and dozens of dust particles where you have to manually remove photos after photos. That's a pain. <laughs> so yeah, the self-cleaning sensor, it was introduced in the E1. Ever since every single camera from Olympus, Panasonic has the self-cleaning sensor and they actually use, it's very smart. They use the in-sensor, in-body uh, sensor-based image stabilization, the same unit to vibrate the, the sensor. So the, the image stabilizer will stabilize the camera while it's turned on so that you get a steady shot if you use slow shutter speeds. And when you turn on the camera, every time, it just shakes the sensor quickly and to, to remove all the dust uh, so that you have a dust-free shooting, right? So I thought, yeah, it was, this was introduced by Four Thirds and it took other manufacturers quite some time, several years later, to catch up, whereas Four Thirds has enjoyed this from day one, like 20 years ago, right? So I thought, yeah, this was one of the things that Four Thirds pushed the industry and to show that, hey, you know, uh, sensor cleaning, uh, self-sensor cleaning is actually a good thing. And they introduced it in four thirds and ultimately everyone 
adopt uh, that. <laughs> All right. Back to the comments. Stewart says, the problem is, is I do YouTube as well. I do go for a new video camera or a new steels camera. Why don't you go for a hybrid? You know, like the OM-1 or G9 Mark II. I think any of these two cameras would do you really well. I'm doing most of my YouTube videos on the EM5 Mark III and recently on my EM1 Mark II. Uh, I think EM5 Mark III, EM1 Mark II, for me, is sufficient. I know a lot of people say, ah, oh, but they don't have like 4K 120. You know, it doesn't have open gate. It doesn't shoot like 6K over simple, whatever. Um, I understand in terms of Kodak, it doesn't have 422, doesn't have 10 bit video, this and that. Um, if you are really serious about filmmaking, if you're really serious about doing videography, then I think Panasonic is a better solution, right? I think OM system is still catching up. Santik says, is if for thirds includes flash system, because it seems Panasonic and Olympus third party flashes work both ways. Yes, I am actually using a, an my flash is a bit far away, I can't get it. Uh, I'm using a four thirds flash. It refused to die. I think I had that flash since 2010. It's a FL50R. Wow, it has been 13 years. <laughs> yes, it's a four thirds flash. Floris and Romy says, Hi Robin, did you hear the new speculations about the Panf Mark II? Do you have any idea about what OM system will release or what would you like them to release? Greetings from Holland. I have no connections whatsoever with uh, OM Digital Solutions. Uh, I have left being the ambassador and we don't have an official representation of OM Digital Solutions in Malaysia. We only have uh, a distributor, an official distributor, a caretaker of a brand. Uh, I'm very close with them, but of course, uh, they don't have any information and I, I didn't receive anything. I didn't hear anything about any new cameras whatsoever. Whatever you hear in the rumors, it's the same that I've heard, nothing new, right? Uh, about what I would like to see in Panf Mark II, I've actually done a live session before uh, talking about the wish list for Panf Mark II. So if you have not seen that video, please just search my live streams. I think it was the second or third live streams that I did. Uh, we have had a long uh, list of discussions with a lot of people commenting about their wish list and what they want to see or the features added in the Panf Mark II. Right, I'm not going to repeat it in this stream. You can go and check out that video later. Tom says, I did not know that Olympus Micro Four Thirds lenses were telecentric. Are all the Olympus Micro Four Thirds lens telecentric? Yes, yes they are. And if you go to the, I don't know if they still have it. Uh, previously, OMD has like a website or Olympus will OMD something something before OM Digital, Digital Solutions took over. They list out all the technologies uh, that they adopted like 5 axis image stabilization, live composite. Uh, the main one, one of the ones that was at the very top was the telecentric optical design, which uh, was in the website telling us that yes, they did use the telecentric design. Steve says, I will mail my wallet now to OMD for a new Panf Mark II. <laughs> An empty wallet, right? You take out everything, just mail them the empty wallet. I would do that too. Santik says, I thought Canon came out with supersonic dust sensor cleaning with the 400D back in 2006-2007. Santix, E1 was launched in 2003. So if you're saying that they launched their first supersonic dust sensor in 2006-2007, uh, that's like three or four years later. <laughs> they are catching up. Huri Serafin says, it's pretty impressive you read everyone. Yes, I tried to reply to everyone because I realized that I cannot comment, uh, sorry, I cannot reply to the written comments anymore. I get like hundreds and hundreds of comments every day. I still try to reply as much as I can, but it's just impossible. So now I'm going live so that I'm making myself available. If anything important you want to ask me, you can ask me here and I will reply to each and every one of you. I will not skip any comment or any question, all right? So that's the least I can do because you guys watch my videos. I'm very, very thankful for that. One of the few things that I can do for return is being here, talking to you guys and have a nice chat and conversation. And Trick says, I recently had a discussion with a former Micro Four Thirds ambassador who said Micro Four Thirds sensors cannot be considered professional. Interesting comment, but I disagree with that statement. That's the issue with a lot of ambassadors, right? Like one day, ooh, 
Canon is the best camera because they are the Canon ambassador. And the next day, they, they use Sony, right? They become a Sony ambassador. Oh no, Canon is not good enough. Sony has better autofocus. That's why I need Sony, right? And next day, that oh, they become a Panasonic ambassador. They use micro filters. Ah, full frame is not necessary. You know, micro filter is good enough. And the next day, Nikon hired them and become an ambassador. It's like, oh no, micro filter sensor is too small. I need full frame. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting how they backtrack the comments like if you see uh, this is like a trend I understand like as content creators especially youtubers they need to sell they need to get views they need clickbait so they keep jumping around creating like very controversial and very clickbaity titles like oh I dumped Nikon Nikon is no longer good enough I've switched from Canon to Sony Sony is the future wow global shutter is the next big, next big thing I will not use anything without a global shutter you know you get what I mean they need this huge uh, attention grab titles to to sell the channel right so that people can come and buy whatever they are selling the merchandise uh lightroom presets or lats or whatever or t-shirts whatever right whereas like here i am <laughs> i have been using four thirds since day one right so well technically my first four thirds camera is this uh well my e410 was stolen so this is my first four thirds cam um a dslr e520 and then i have the e5 Right, which was my professional tool for a while. And then of course, after that, then I migrated to Micro Four Thirds. Then I became a micro, uh, the Olympus Visionary, which is ambassador for the Olympus brand. And I left Olympus. I still stay with Micro Four Thirds. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people say, Robin, go for Sony. Sony is so much better. Robin, you should consider Fuji. I'm like, guys, what is with all these weird suggestions? Just because I left the ambassador program doesn't mean that my camera stopped functioning. Just because I quit being ambassador doesn't mean my micro photos cameras are not good. If I say my E1 or sorry, my EM1 Mark II, if I say my EM1 Mark III was an awesome camera in my reviews, even if I've quit being an ambassador, I still think they're awesome. The camera didn't change. My opinion didn't change just because I don't, you know, I'm not associated directly officially with them anymore. I am a Micro Four Thirds supporter first and Olympus Visionary second. I have to believe in the system first before I can tell you guys how awesome it is. It is not because they get me to become an ambassador that I tell you that it's good. I genuinely tell it's good so that I've left the system. I still use them. I still, if you have followed my channel, I've left them for more than one year now. Uh, and I still actively shoot my jobs with the, my, my Micro Four Thirds system. I still use my Micro Four Thirds to do my personal projects, right? So yeah, there's this thing about, you know, it's quite disappointing and disheartening to hear that once and a Micro Four Thirds ambassador and now they said, nah, it's not good enough. I'm like, wow. Integrity means very little in this world. <laughs> Santik says, so it was Olympus first for sensor self-cleaning. Yes, 2003. You, oh, don't, don't, don't trust me. You know, always, what, what they say? Trust, but verify. You can always Google uh, Olympus E1 and read, read it for yourself. Brian says, I know this is a rumor, but camera beta just leaked the image of OM10 that rumored released early in first quarter. Yeah, I hope I hope they release an OM10 soon. Uh, we have the OM1 already, we have OM5, I guess logical release will be the OM10, right? My only wish is not that they don't recycle all the parts, like don't use the, the older parts from the EM10 Mark IV, and please no micro USB, please at least give us USB-C, at least give us uh, face detection autofocus right let's give us 4k video with really good autofocus and don't 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 hold back right just give us what we want there will be an awesome om10 i might even buy one if the specifications and the price is right terry says hello from pennsylvania do you think software such as topaz will help bridge the gap between full frame and micro four thirds uh for me i never use topaz or whatever and i never i admit that there is a gap uh, full frame is definitely better in some 
scenarios or some areas like dynamic range in high ISO. Uh, Topaz does nothing to improve dynamic range. It will improve, uh, it will just clean up the noise a little bit. But to me, it doesn't matter because I leave the noise in, my clients didn't complain, my photos get published, my photos get printed, my photos is everywhere in the newspaper, uh, my clients' websites everywhere, and they look fine. My clients are happy, they still come back and they hire me. So yeah, if you find that Topaz is useful for you, uh, if it helps you to be a little bit more confident, go for it. I don't need it. I find that Micro Four Thirds is more than sufficient to get a job done, and I'm very happy with what my Micro Four Thirds cameras can do. Carl Richard says, good evening, Robin. Hope you are well. Hey, Carl. Very happy to see you here. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I hope you are good too. Santik says, I mean, if Fortress system includes TTL protocol for flash, of course it does. Uh, wonder if Fortress systems technology include mount, mount context or yeah. So the TTL compatible flash with Four Thirds is of, of course compatible with Micro Four Thirds. But if you use those flash on Canon's uh, camera, then it's just manual. It's the same if you use Canon's TTL flash on Olympus cameras, then it's just fully manual, right? You can use the flash everywhere. If you want to enjoy the TTL, the, the contacts, the electronic pins, the arrangement is different from camera to camera. And of course, the programming is different, right? Yumi says, I love how Four Thirds have image stabilization and this carried on to Micro Four Thirds. Yes, that is actually the next, <laughs> the next item that I'm going to touch about uh, image stabilization and how Four Thirds push image stabilization, right? Uh, Tom says, thank you, Robin. No worries, no worries. Um, 24707222 says, hi, Robin. Hey, you have a very long name. I've learned so much about Olympus Camera because of your videos. Please keep going to be a good influence for us. Thank you so much. And thanks for letting me know that you found my videos beneficial. Uh, it's always good for me to, to, to have this kind of feedback so that, hey, I also feel inspired to go out and make more videos and share with you guys, right? So thanks for being here. Thanks for watching the videos and thanks for the support. I appreciate you. Yumi says, as you said, Robin, ambassadors are salespeople, nothing against them. They just need to promote what the job needs. Yes, that is true. I agree. A lot of ambassadors, they promote uh, whatever they, they are promoting, but I just wish that there is some integrity left after they have uh, quit the ambassador program, right? You can quit, and let's say you were a Nikon ambassador, and then next day you use Sony ambassador, but you should not badmouth Nikon. You get what I mean? You shouldn't be saying, oh, now Sony is the next best thing. Nikon is not good enough. You can say your reasons why you use Sony because Sony has certain features that Nikon doesn't have. And maybe the sensor has slightly better dynamic range and has like the 61 megapixel resolution, which will help you in your job. But you never said, oh, Nikon is not good enough. Oh, now Nikon is so bad. It's like you're backtracking and you're invalidating what Ever that you have done and all your work will be coming undone because you just move on to become another brand's ambassador, right? I mean, just keep some integrity intact, you know? How, how difficult is it, you know? Seriously. Sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Hello, Robin. Thank you for your videos. No worries. Good, great job. Oh, you're so kind. Your positive energy in each video makes my day. Oh, thank you so much. You're too, too kind. Yeah. The reason, the main reason I do my videos and um, I publish them on YouTube is so that I can share my joy and my passion of photography with all you guys. All I want, genuinely, is for everyone to pick up the camera and go out and shoot. If I can help you, if I can help you to understand your camera a little bit better, if I can inspire you to go out and take some photographs, I will be very happy. That will make my day. So thank you so much. John says, Robin, something a bit different. I need to get a microphone to be able to talk to my desktop computer. Any recommendations? Uh, this microphone that I'm using is a Maono. I, it doesn't have any model number, but it's a cheap China Maono brand. I bought it for like less than 100 ringgit, so that's like 20 US dollars. Uh, it's a USB microphone, so it's plug and play. You plug into the, the computer, and you just straight away can, can immediately start talking. And it has a volume knob for you to control the volume, right? So I think this is a very good microphone. It is foolproof almost. 
it's just plug and play. Of course, you can tweak in the software in your computer to to further adjust how your your voice sounds like, right? Uh, I wouldn't say that I recommend this if you can afford to spend maybe like 100 or 200 US dollars on a microphone. Uh, maybe you can look at Audio Technica or maybe look at other more established brands like Sennheiser or Rode or I don't know. There are many very, very well-established microphone brands. I'm just buying this because, hey, uh, I got this during the pandemic. It was the lockdown. I have to do video in my room. Uh, and um, in my room, it was quite echoey. So my usual lavalier setup, it doesn't really work. So I got this to try, see if it works. This was really cheap and it works. Since it is very good, it sounds really well. I just continue using it. <laughs> right, so yeah, you can look for a condenser microphone, a USB microphone preferably so that it's easy, right? I'm a la lazy person. The simpler the setup is, the better. Stewart says, I don't care what camera the photo was shot on. I use the tool I need to get the shot I want. Yes, that is very true. Thank you so much Zoltan for the love. Santik says, the original Photos Alliance include Olympus, Panasonic, Kodak, Fuji, Leica, if not mistaken. You are right. It includes all of them. I'm not sure about Fuji though, but Kodak and Leica, yes, definitely. Andrew Banner. Hello, Robin. Late to the party today. No, you're not late, Andrew. Uh, it's only been about 15 minutes since I started the stream. So welcome to the live stream, Andrew, and very, very nice to see you. How are you, Andrew? Steve says, Microfotters always appears to have the best online community. If I shot something else, I would miss it. Yes. And that's also true if you have a good community to share not just your photographs, but uh, to bounce ideas, to, to talk to each other. I think it's also a healthy place. It can encourage growth, right? It makes things a lot more enjoyable. So yeah, I think Micro Photos community is pretty awesome. Brand says, yes, I think Olympus will dump the micro USB in favor of USB-C as it mandates by Europe. If you notice that Panasonic today re-released the G100 to G100D and they dumped that micro USB and replaced with USB. USB-C. I hope so too. I hope that in the future we get all USB-C. It just makes things so much easier. Octavian says, Hi Robin. Hey Octavian, how are you? Thanks for doing these lives. Are you setting up the white balance every time you are out shooting stuff? Is it better to use white or gray sample for that? Is 12F2 good for a video? Wow, you have three questions. So I'll tackle them one by one. Uh, I just leave my camera's white balance to auto most of the time, not all the time, auto most of the time. In fact, uh, I'm using OM1 now. The stream that you're seeing on this camera is actually OM1. And I've actually used custom white balance. I didn't use gray card. I just set the custom white balance. I look at the screen until I feel the color is right. Then I stay with that custom white balance. So this one I use custom white balance. But when I'm doing my street photography, because mostly it's under daylight, I think if your camera's auto white balance cannot handle sunlight, you can throw the camera away, like seriously. And there are cameras that cannot handle it properly. I'm gonna talk about those in my coming videos, right? Uh, in difficult lighting conditions, it depends. Uh, if the light keeps changing, I'll just leave it to auto and I'll deal with the white balance in post-processing, all right? But I shoot in RAW, I don't shoot in JPEG. But if I know that I can control the white balance, if nothing changed, for studio shoots, right? If I'm doing a job and I'm shooting a product, for consistency's sake, if my client is breathing down my neck, if I'm shooting tattered from the camera to computer, I can't have one photo with one white balance and the next photo with a different white balance. So my clients will look at me like, Robin, like, why are the colors different? Like, you know, I want my products to look consistent, right? So then, of course, manual white balance comes really, really handy. Uh, I don't use gray cards. I don't use the one touch white balance whatsoever. I always use auto like 90% of the time and the rest of the 10% is a manual white balance. I control the Kelvin temperature. Now your second question is, uh, is it better to use white or gray sample for that gray? Because the camera calculates more accurately for gray. If you're going to use the one touch white balance, always use gray if possible, right? Uh, is 12F2 good for video? Yes, yes it is. Uh, depends on what you want to do. May I tempt you to consider Panasonic 9 f1.7? If you need as wide as possible, if you're going to hold a camera in front of you vlogging, I personally think that the 9mm f1.7 is a better lens. But other than that, general video shooting, the Olympus 12 f2 is an excellent, excellent lens. Right, 
Zach Benson says, Hello Robin. Hey Zach, nice to see you here. How are you? Good morning from Colorado, USA. I'm setting up for a sunrise photo with my new, for me, EM1 Mark II. It's been fantastic since I got it last week. Congratulations. Thank you for your advice and being great. No worries. I share as much as I can. I'm glad that, sorry, you are getting the you have the EM1 Mark II and you're enjoying it. It's such a fantastic camera. It's my main workhorse today. Santik says, out of topic, about raw processing on an iPad. I try now using raw power iOS app. It is 24 ringgit on Black Friday sale. Great for editing my street and family photos. Oh, that's great. Amazing. I think a lot of people just use Lightroom, right? It's just so much easier. You can sync on the cloud uh, using Lightroom or on your phone on your tablet, on your computer, right? It's just, everything is in one place. But anyways, if it works for you, I think it's, it's awesome. Yumi says, if only there was a micro four thirds camera with the old Kodak sensor, they only concentrated on photos, no video requirements. That will require Kodak to still exist, right? Kodak died. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately without Kodak, we cannot get Kodak sensors, right? That's just sad. Angelo says, hi Robin. Hey Angelo, how are you? Greetings from the Netherlands. Very nice to see you here. Santik says, photo memory card was from Olympus, but not sure if part of photo system. No, it is not. Uh, Andrew Banner says, uh, it's talking to another person, no worries. Santik says, Lumix G100D is with USB-C and OLED EVF. Nothing else changes. Just USB-C and uh, USB two speeds yeah that's great for me says where might i buy a shuttle therapy baseball cap <laughs> this was custom made by the way uh it's cheap uh, the quality is very bad i think the words will peel off anytime soon i'm just buying this just for fun and you know it's i thought it's quite cool i have a very plain setup i don't have like neon lights in my background it's just a plain white wall with uh, paint chipping off and I know I have this uh, light box at my side uh, yeah I thought like uh, a custom cap here with different uh, messages I had one let's do this I have like micro four thirds and I'll shut the therapy I thought this message would, add, would spice things up a little bit all right uh, time check it is almost 10 o'clock in Malaysia and we have been live for almost one hour and there is 90 of you here uh, live concurrently. That's a lot of you. I'm going to drink some coffee. And I'm going to continue with my talking points. Hmm. And I'm going to drink some water. I'm going to keep hydrated. Hey, I've been talking for one hour nonstop. So I got to stay hydrated. All right, let's uh, continue on with the points about four thirds impact on the imaging industry. A lot of you may not know this, uh, but the live view, when you shoot through the camera's LCD screen, like you're know, looking through the screen here, or the screen, right? Shooting through the camera screen. Uh, Yes, it was already available for compact cameras. A lot of compact cameras have that. But it was Olympus and it was the four thirds camera that first adopted live view in DSLR in a professional environment. You know, this was done in E330. I forgot the year and um, that doesn't matter. It was one of the first few DSLRs by uh, Olympus, right? So imagine. Olympus introduced live view so you can look at the screen and compose through the screen and take photographs. They introduced live view. And when they introduced that, they got a huge backlash from the community. Everyone was saying, no, you know, when I want to take photographs, I don't want to look at the, the camera screen. You know, I don't want to look at the screen. I, I normally shoot uh, my, my photographs looking through the viewfinder, right? If, if I don't use the viewfinder, I don't look like a professional photographer. Shooting with the screen makes me look like a noob, like I'm not a pro. To be a pro, you only shoot with the, the viewfinder, right? The optical viewfinder in DSLR. <laughs> they got so much backlash. It was such a huge... Uh, controversial thing that they introduced live view in the E330. Guess what? Today, every single camera has a live view. 
it didn't take long though they complained everyone complained nah we don't need live view you know canon nicole says nah we don't need live view a few years later Everyone has live viewing the DSLRs. <laughs> it was also Olympus who introduced the uh, tilt screen and uh, swivel screen, right? The screen that flips out uh, like that. Yep, it was Olympus who introduced this and then they were like, who does that? You know, like Olympus has it. And then when, when Canon has it, the first camera that I had was the 60D DSLR. They make it like such a huge deal. Like, oh, now you have creative freedom. And they market it like they invented the swivel screen. Like, hello, Olympus had it like five years before you had it. <laughs> so yeah, I think live view was significant because it introduced a different way to compose your photograph in a different way it's not necessarily better but an option is always good of course earlier days the screen has very low resolution very low refresh rate you can't really judge from the screen but as the screen the size gets bigger and bigger as the resolution improve like these days you know like i actually shoot 50 percent through the live view the lcd screen and 50 percent through the viewfinder because one tip, if you want to improve your photography, don't just stick the camera to your face through a viewfinder all the time because you're shooting through the eye level and everyone looks through the eye level. That perspective is can get repetitive and a bit boring. To make things more interesting, move the camera away from your face, go high or go low. And you can use the LCD screen for composition, right? Go low for dramatic impact, go high, climb somewhere higher and then just bring the camera away from your, your eye level to get a different point of view. That can add variety to your compositions, it can add a lot of creativity in your framing and you can show things in a perspective that people don't normally see from the standing eye level kind of perspective, right? So there's one way to, to make things better. And Olympus introduced that in the live view. I thought this actually created a huge huge impact in the industry they first introduced it and they were ridiculed for that and everyone else had it and today every single camera has the live view and technically electronic viewfinder is also live view to think about it right so yeah i thought that was that was pretty interesting uh to look at a lot to a lot to to be grateful and thankful and uh to celebrate for the, the contributions from for thirds dslr so to to cap quickly we had the telecentric optical design to optimize image quality we have a self sensor cleaning which really helps especially if you're a professional photographer you don't want to spend hours and hours just to remove dust spots on your images right so that helps a lot uh, on your workflow especially you have like a lot of photographs to deliver to clients and now of course olympus or the four thirds they also uh push or introduce live view first in a dslr and show to the world that professional photographers also need live view and it's a very effective and powerful way to take photographs <laughs> all right let's get back to the comments Kaka, uh, Kajakop says hi Robin hey Kajakop how are you uh, Northern Views says hi Robin greetings from near Manchester UK what are your thoughts on DJI Pocket 3 for content creation uh, Colin hey Colin how are you thanks for being here I have the DJI Pocket 3 and I have shot five videos using the DJI Pocket 3 you haven't seen the videos yet because I have not published them. The videos will start to be published in January. So I'm making some videos uh, ahead because uh, I'm taking two weeks break in December. I will announce the break when I do. Uh, usually at the end of the year, I take about one to two weeks completely. Uh, no jobs, uh, no, no video making. I don't take photos. I just want a clean break so that I can spend time with family and friends, uh, take time to recover so that I can start fresh on 1st of January and then I will go full engine speed ahead. So in order to have that stretch of break i need to make videos in advance so i have made uh, five videos using that dji pocket 3 and i think it is excellent but you have to be very specific that dji pocket 3 is only for vlogging and it's only for video and you are stuck at wide angle 20 millimeters if you're okay with 20 millimeters all the time if you're okay with just video you don't take any photographs if you're okay with a device that has very weird handling because you're gonna hold it in a stick and if you're okay with all of that and you, you gotta take care of the camera because the gimbal head seems very fragile and there are already reports that the gimbal heads as of the DJI Pocket 3, they're already broken if you search YouTube, right? So there are people already uh, 
they managed to to destroy the Pocket 3 already because it's so fragile. So it's not like an OMD camera where you can just you know move around, handle it with, without thinking too much. Uh, takes amazing photos. If you don't do video, you know you can change lens. You can use like 400, 100 to 400 lens or macro lens or wide angle lens or fisheye lens or any lens that you want or uh, f1.2 lens, right? So here in the DJI, you're stuck with one lens. You're stuck with just making video. If you're okay with that, it is perhaps the best option for vlogging out there. <laughs> All right, uh, Santik says, photo memory card was Olympus creation. I don't think so. I don't think Olympus invented any memory card. John Yazi says, uh, 87 watching, but only 11 likes. Give a thumb, thumbs up if you're enjoying the stream. Thank you so much, John, for the reminder. You are too kind. Ryujo Shinkunshi Ryu says, I see that you're back to your black Kanyam cup. Yes. Black Kanyam. <laughs> yeah, I had a white one, right? Uh, yeah, I, I use it interchangeably. Uh, yeah, I like the black one, of course. Hmm. Santik says, if Panasonic contributed to Four Thirds, I think they did. Uh, the Flash, this is a little bit of an industry trade. The Flash was made by Panasonic. Panasonic made I'm not going to name brands or models, but they made flashes for most parts of the industry at one time. Of course, not now, but there was a time when Panasonic made all the flashes. Ha, fun fact for you guys to digest. Octavian says, Hey Robin, thanks for the answers to previous questions. One more. What would you use? What would one use a lens with clutch if modern cameras offer autofocus to manual focus mode? Is there a difference in using them? Story still learning. It's different, hey. If you are sometimes you don't want autofocus at all, you want to be full manual for 100% control. Because if you have autofocus to manual focus, once you're done and then you leave it and you come back, you half press the shutter button, the focus will just run away. So for the manual focusing clutch, it's full manual. Once you have locked the manual focusing in one position, you leave it there. If your camera and the subject don't move, all you have to do is just press the shutter button and you'll nail the shot again and again. But if you have autofocus to manual focus, plus manual focus, every time you half press the shutter button, the autofocus just runs away. That's a very big difference there. Right. John says, I have to have an electronic viewfinder. I wish Olympus had kept the accessory EVF for the PL cameras deal breaker for me. I guess this is the case where they had a lot of great ideas and they have a lot of innovation, but because not enough people buy the EVF, right? So most people who bought the EPL cameras, the pen light cameras, it's quite obvious, these are entry-level users, these are casual shooters, these are the people or the consumers that will just buy the camera and they will not add on any other accessories. They are happy with the LCD screen and they don't need to use the viewfinder. A lot of people who need the viewfinder would have gone for EM1 or EM10 or EM5. So a lot of people buy EPL because from the start they know that they don't need the, the electronic viewfinder. And those people who buy these cameras, they are very... Uh, they are newcomers, they are beginners, so they don't necessarily want to spend a lot of money on accessories or upgrading gear or adding on too much attachments. So they are definitely not going to buy an internet viewfinder. So because the sales of the internet viewfinder is so bad, and perhaps even Olympus was losing money from making this electronic viewfinder separately, so as a business decision, they just discontinued the electronic viewfinder and they took away the attachment in the camera because that attachment also costs money. It may be just a few dollars, but it is still money if you manufacture like thousands of units, right? It's still going to cost like tens of or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So to cut back the cost, obviously the company wasn't doing well. It's no secret. Uh, and they have to look at what the consumers want and what they don't want. And based on the sales numbers, it's very obvious that majority of people don't want that attachment. I understand that we want everything. If you want, if you could tell me the camera can make coffee, I want the camera to make coffee. But will people use it to make coffee? If, you, if people don't use it to make coffee, they'll take that coffee making ability away. It's just as simple as that. it's business, right? Unfortunately. Terry says, it's like pre-burst, pro-capture and high-res Olympus had it for years and once the Nikon and Canon get it, they make out it's, it's never been available before. Yes. 
Exactly, and of course, moving on to Micro Four Thirds era, uh, Olympus has a lot of technology like electronic viewfinder, image five axis image stabilization. They have like live composite. They have uh, the pre burst pro capture mode and high res mode. They have all kinds of computation computational features, which was copied by everyone else, right? And they claim that it's theirs. Vladimir says Micro Four Thirds is supreme. Is over other poor systems? No, I, I don't agree with you. What I can say is Micro Four Thirds is awesome and it's more than sufficient and I love Micro Four Thirds, but to claim that it is better than everyone else, that is just false. It's no different from a uh, full frame camera user saying that Micro Four Thirds is crap. It's just another person saying another similar thing, right? So no, it's not better than anyone else. It is an awesome system, it is for me, and I love using Micro Four Thirds, and I'm gonna stop there. Santix says, the Olympus Older Four Thirds system live view is by a separate sensor and only a 30 seconds limit, right? No, that's not true. Uh, like this, both this, uh, I have two cameras with live view here, E520. There is no, there's no time limit. You can use the live view full time, and it's actually using the main sensor. It's not a separate sensor. The other sensor is Sony. You're talking about Sony's implementation. And I don't even, they are using another different sensor for live view. There is no time limit. And this E5 also, like, you can use the live view uh, for a very, very long duration of time. No issue whatsoever. All right, gonna put the camera down. Zach Benson says, one of the best things Micro Four Thirds has done is make photography more accessible to people with mobility issues that cannot carry heavy kits. All right, that's cool. Terry Day says, the question, will OM system be as innovative going forward? I hope so. Hey, like when they launched the EM5 and then subsequently the EM1 in the Micro Four Thirds era, man, they have those cameras are like game changers. They are like, wow, they are seriously wow camera. And we don't see that anymore these days. We need those wow camera moments like nowadays, right? Brand says, just look at four third sensor patterns paper. It specifies a sensor diagonal of 22.5 millimeters with an imaging diagonal of 21.63. Along mid the specs, as long mid the specs, the sensor doesn't have to be four thirds aspect ratio. <laughs> true, that's true. You, you got something going on there. Brand says, I hope they make full third sensor that is uh, square in format, one to one, that'll be awesome. I think it's not easy now because micro four thirds uh, lenses, they are not compatible with a square sensor. The, the lenses are optimized for rectangular current four third size sensor. So if they suddenly change the sensor size, they may need to change the lens mount and the lens design as well. So that may not be feasible. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. If they have done this from day one, it would have been awesome. But to suddenly have a change now, that is actually not a very good strategy. Northern View says, thank you for your thorough answer. Great advice as usual. No worries. I share what I can. John Allen says, try out the Pocket One first. Why? Pocket One is crap. Horrible autofocus. Uh, really, really bad image quality. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I got the Pocket 3 is because 1 inch image sensor, uh, f2 lens, like dramatically improved uh, autofocus. The tracking is actually really, 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 really good. The microphone itself is awesome. Like, I don't even need a separate microphone, I just talk to the Pocket 3 directly and I can settle it's like my all in one video solution right i don't need a separate microphone like pocket one has terrible microphone the autofocus doesn't work very well and the lens also wasn't wide enough it's not as wide as pocket three i remember it's not what i'm saying is pocket one is not good enough andrew banner says if anyone treats an osmo pocket or any gimbal with any disrespect they will probably damage it the osmo pocket two seems more rugged than the Osmo Pocket 1. No experience of the third one. I'm using the third one, but I've only been using it for a month, so I can't... Well, I haven't destroyed it, so we'll see how long it lasts. Satik says, I read somewhere that uh, SD picture card made by Olympus to compete with SD MMC card. Nah, they just want something proprietary. Like, for example, Sony has the um, uh, memory stick, right? So they just want to have their own thing. Uh, whereas Olympus will have the XD card, whereas everyone else uses SD and SD is like a more popular choice. That's why today most people use SD. 
Jeff Painter, hey, how are you? Very nice to see you here. Hey, Jeff, thanks for joining in the conversation. John says, Robin, do you use your camera on a gimbal for your street videos? No, I don't. Uh, doesn't make sense. When I'm on the street, I want to be as minimal as possible. And even my street videos, I don't use a uh, camera. For the most POV videos that you see, uh, up to this point, I haven't shown any videos from the Osmo Pocket 3 yet, the DJI Pocket 3, I haven't shown any video. They were all shot with an action camera. So it's a small device, I, I talk to, to it, I don't even use a separate microphone, a small device and a camera, and that's it. I don't want to have like a gimbal, a camera, and this, and that, and a microphone, and, oh, and a lens. It's just it's heavy, it's difficult, like, I, have, I, I don't have five hands. I only have two hands, right? So no, I don't use my, my camera on a gimbal and I don't foresee myself using gimbal because I'm not a filmmaker, I'm not a videographer, I don't produce documentary or I don't shoot for Hollywood or a TV production. I'm only shooting video for myself. And whatever I'm doing now is, to me at least, it's more than sufficient to get my point across for me to share uh, my photographs and the tips and tricks or you know, talking about cameras and lenses. It's more than enough for, for what I do now. I don't need a gimbal. It just complicates things. The less I have, the less I use, the better. You got to remember, as, as I go to the streets, right, or if I, I'm making video, I have a tripod, I have a camera, and I have a microphone. Sometimes I have a voice recorder, I have a HDMI recorder, then I have the camera that I'm using, right? And then I have all these things, it's, and I have to look at my phone for, for the, sometimes I have a draft, an outline of the, the video that I'm talking about. I'm handling like six or seven devices, it's just overwhelming, right? So if I can simplify my workflow, it's definitely better. And Drew Banner says, Robin, I guess the flashes made by Panasonic for lots of others may date back to when it was National Panasonic. Yep, you are right. You are not wrong. Santex says, if the micro four thirds accessory port is interchangeable port with Panasonic accessory port, I I don't think so. But fun fact, uh, some of the Olympus electronic viewfinder, you can use it on Leica cameras. Ha. Ah. Interesting, right? <laughs> Sorry, I cannot read your name. Good day, sir. Uh, hello from one of your viewers from Moscow. Hey, how are you? I love mine, my Olympus EPL one with 15 f8 uh, body cap lens as an everyday camera. That is a very nice setup. You have a very small camera and the EPL one has slow autofocus, but you're using a manual focus lens anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Brand is talking to Suntex. Kodak once sold sensors to Olympus for use in the four thirds bodies, but the new Olympus four thirds cameras use Panasonic sensor. Yeah, this uh, E1 uh, uses a Kodak image sensor. Yeah. John Yazi says, uh, it's talking to Suntex, the accessory parts on Olympus and Panasonic were not compatible or interchangeable. Yep, they are not. Brand says, apparently, Micro Four Thirds currently the lens support for. SQ sensor, what is the SQ sensor? As long as square sensor, it follow the diagonal they describe. No, they, they don't, the lens do not support. I think Mate Sonato was talking about it as well. I know that it's a nice concept, it's very nice to have, but the lens do not support the square format. Trust me, I know, I worked for Olympus before. <laughs> I wouldn't lie to you. Yumi says, I really like your live chats and you're taking time for all your viewers. Thanks, and all of you are very important to me. Just wanted to ask, which lens are you using for this live video? A 17 f1.8. Sometimes I use the 15 f1.7, but I find that the 17 f1.8 is a little bit tighter, so you don't see my messy room. <laughs> I'm in my bedroom, by the way. Hey, this is my bed behind me. Uh, yeah, my room is... Yeah, I'm... I'm busy, I go out and shoot and, you know, I do my shot to therapy, meet friends. I, yeah, my room gets messy, so I don't want you guys to see that. So the tighter the lens, the better. So it was the, it is the 17 f1.8. <laughs> Ivan says, uh, although Olympus has made some advances in video, it still takes a back seat to photography. I believe prioritizing video has led to Panasonic's success with true hybrid designs. I agree with you. Panasonic has uh, cemented the, the position in the market um, their GH series cameras are seen as serious filmmaking tools that uh, professional filmmakers will not hesitate to pick up to do the professional work, right? Uh, yeah, if you don't want to use Sony or other
better, more established system. Panasonic is a system that you can consider from Micro Four Thirds. And if you look at the output, the video output, and the specifications, the video features, everything that pack into the Panasonic Lumix uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras is way ahead of what um, Olympus or OM system Micro Four Thirds cameras can do. That is, uh, that is a fact. Kajakop says, I have five Micro Four Thirds cameras and now the effect is that I bought a Sony ASC3. <laughs> hey, I'm also looking at these older NES3, NES5 cameras. They are get, the price is getting lower and lower in the used market. I might just nap one and just start playing with it and do like a POV video or something. I think it'll be really fun exploring what these cameras can do. One, and what Sony did right and wrong in these cameras or the things that we can utilize, adopt in modern cameras or some of the things that Sony could have improved in these older cameras, right? I thought that would, that would be really fun. Yeah, I need to scour the marketplace uh, to look for these uh, products. David Pascal Lobitz says, Micro Four Thirds is Awesome. I use a Sony S7C and wanted a Lumix GH5 too. Love the crop factor. Yes, Micro Photo is definitely awesome. And yeah, go get the GH5 Mark II. What is stopping you, David? Oh, Brian Tan. Thank you so much, Brian, for the super chat. Uh, Brian says, thank you, Robin. You are resourceful as always. No worries. I share everything that I can. Uh, I do as much as I can here and yeah, it's my joy to share with you guys my knowledge, my experience uh, as, as well as my photographs. Right? I have fresh photographs every single week for you guys. So again, um, thank you so much for the super chat, Brian, and thanks everyone who have contributed to me, whether it's through my Buy Me Coffee or uh, through my direct PayPal contribution. Thank you so much. Uh, every Every little bit of the contribution, it helps me to fund my next video because making videos, as much as I, I want to keep it as minimal as in the cost as possible, some of them actually cost money, all right? And I need to use my own resources, my own funds to, to create these videos. I'm using my own time and a lot of effort to make these videos. So any contribution from you guys, it definitely helped me a lot in making future videos so that I can continue on to share as much as I can and publish everything here. So thanks, Brian. I really appreciate you and thanks for everyone who have contributed. And you guys are so, so, so awesome. All right. Let's come back to the comments. GY Game says, what do you think about the first generation Lumix series, like the G1, G GF1, and GH1? Still worth to buy them today. Now, I'm not too familiar with Panasonic earlier cameras because it's so hard to find them uh, at that time, and they were so expensive. But uh, I would suggest that you at least get the 16 megapixels image sensor generation. I don't know which camera in Panasonic started to use the 16 megapixels. In Olympus, it was the EPL5, it was the EM5 or EM1, and then the EPL6, like I think the EP, EP5. Yeah, the EP3 was the 12 megapixels, the EPL3 was the 12 megapixels. So anything with the 12 megapixels, that was the first generation, I would advise you to at least consider getting the 16 megapixels generation. Uh, you have better dynamic range, better high ISO, of course, a little bit more resolution. And at that time, the autofocus also has improved so much that, you know, in the beginning when, when Panasonic and Olympus launched the Micro Four Thirds system, the autofocus was actually painfully slow. And that's true for the G1, GF1, the autofocus is actually quite slow at that time. So if you can go for the generation with the 16 megapixel image sensor, you can get a lot more benefit. And I think you'll enjoy using the cameras a little bit better. Animal Infotainment says, Good evening, Robin. Hey, thanks for being here. Nice to see you. I have no clue about the Four Thirds system. Could you give a brief overview about it? If you don't mind, of course. So Olympus launched the first Four Thirds camera, which was the E1, and the first Four Thirds lens, which is the 1454, uh, f2.8 to 3.5. And then there was like about a 10 years run of Four Thirds DSLRs. It started as DSLR with the traditional pentaprism, viewfinder, optical viewfinder, mirror box. So if you take a photograph, you'll just sl keep slapping. It is a DSLR system. So Four Thirds started as DSLR. And then in the year 2008, uh, both Olympus and Panasonic decided to move micro Four Thirds, which is mirrorless. They removed the mirror, but still keep the large sensor and it created a new mount which is the micro four thirds mount all right 
Uh, and four thirds over the years before Micro Four Thirds, there was a good like six or seven years from 2003. They have contributed a lot in the industry. That's why I'm trying to explore here. The three things I have talked about were telecentric optical design, which was also adopted in Micro Four Thirds design, but it was introduced in 2003 in E1 by Olympus. And all Four Thirds camera has this telecentric design, which is now copied by Canon and Nikon in their full frame mirrorless. Uh, of course, Olympus also introduced in the Four Thirds system, the self-cleaning sensor, the dust reduction system, which uses the supersonic wave filter. So it's usually every time you turn on the camera, the sensor will shake and will just shake off the dust particles off the sensor, right? Uh, they was first introduced in the four thirds and subsequently copied by everyone else. And then uh, Olympus also introduced live view in the four thirds uh, DSLR. The first DSLR of live view was Olympus E330 or E330. And this live view was also, everyone else have, have copied this, this live view. Now, every single camera now has live view, but the first one to introduce it was a four thirds DSLR. <laughs> All right, uh, Indie Comics says, I nominate Robin Wong for Micro Four Thirds User Club President. Oh, you are too kind, Indie, but I don't really want to join any club. I still have uh, trauma, bad memories from joining a, a photography club here in Malaysia. Uh, it's a Micro Four Thirds club. And at that time, I was a Four Thirds user, right? I was using all DSLR, and my, my first Micro Four Thirds camera was EPL one just because I wanted to join the club, right? And they all asked me to join, they pressured me to join. And you know what? They backstabbed me. And after all my contributions, I share my knowledge, my photographs, my tips and tricks, I share everything with them. And one day they just turned their back on me and said, ah, you know what, Robin? You're just a horrible person. And you know what? You're just doing this for glory, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Man, I don't need this drama anymore. And every time I look at any photography society, photography forum, photography groups, clubs, whatever, there's always this politics and people just trying to one up another person and people just trying to, to have all these kind of, of fights. And it's just so toxic. I'm just, I'm, I don't have time for all this drama. I have a photography career, a business to run, and with my free time, I'm making videos here on my YouTube for you guys. And in between, I don't have much time. Like, I really don't need this drama in my life. So, yeah, no clap from me. <laughs> Thanks, though, for the vote of confidence. I appreciate that, Indy. Yumi says, I still have the Lumix GF2, the 2 megapixel sensor now, giving that retro grain look. Yeah. If you still have it, of course, continue using it. Like I said, old cameras are awesome cameras, you know, like, don't have to upgrade the camera just because the newer cameras are better. I'm just saying, if you're starting now, if you have a choice, then maybe go for the 16 megapixel if you can. And I'm sure the price difference isn't so much. Santik says, if not mistaken, Olympus and Panasonic image chip are basically the same FPGA chipset but different firmwares. Not really, not really. Uh, it was known that Panasonic for a while made their own image sensor and Olympus has well, rumored has it that started to take sensors from Sony. But I think Panasonic now may be using Sony sensor. I don't know. These are all just speculations. I'm not going to say things that I'm not 100% sure. Right? I'm just saying that these are assumptions, popular guess. Santik says, if photosystem technology includes imagery chip, if you are talking about image processing, yes. Uh, but then the image processing is not so much a four thirds system, it's more on like Olympus has their own processing engine and Panasonic has their own processing engine, so they all do things a little bit different. Yumi says, the only thing about the GF1, GF2 is no image stabilization. Some Panasonic lenses had stabilization. They were good for a video for its time. Yeah, that is true. I think image stabilization is so important now and Having it in camera makes sense, so they can attach any lens and you still have image stabilization, right? It's just so much more convenient. David Pascal says, which Micro Four Thirds lens would you prefer for street photography? Which focal length and aperture? My favorite has always been the 50, um, sorry, 50 millimeters uh, equivalent. If I'm using a full frame, I do have some full frame cameras now, the Canon 5D and a Nikon uh, D600. Then I'll be using 50 most of the time, 50 f1.8. Uh, if I'm using my Olympus Micro Four Thirds camera, it can be the EM1 Mark II or uh, any of my older cameras, right? Uh, 
I will use the 25 f1.8. These are my favorite, it's equivalent to 50, but sometimes I also use 45 f1.8 if I know that I need to do a lot of uh, close-up portraits. I think 45 does portray a lot better. Uh, it gives equivalent of 90 or close to 85, which is very good for portraits, longer focal length, so you can compress the background a little bit better. You have less background to work with. You have shallow depth of field, um, very nice bokeh, right? So the image just gets separated from the background, you can blur it off. Uh, sometimes I also go wider. I also recently, I really, really like the Panasonic 15 f1.7. I think it's a fantastic lens. I treat it like a 28 millimeters equivalent, though technically it is 30, but 30, 28, whatever is close enough. So the Panasonic 15 f1.7 is so small, so light. I think it's an excellent lens for street photography. I love the 15, I love the 25, I love 45, but if I were to use uh, seriously shoot on the streets, I will use the 25, which is the 50 equivalent. I hope that uh, answers your question. John says, uh, it's talking to JY Game, the JPEGs in later Panasonic cameras are much better than the early models, especially the colors and saturation. Yumi says, the Lumix GS7 is a nice camera if you want an older Lumix, yes. And the GS7 has started using the 16, or it has the 16 megapixel image sensor already, right? Yeah. We wouldn't say uh, G3 was 12 and G5 was 16. Yes, get the 16. Like, there is a difference. Like, seriously, it's a jump. It's a huge jump in terms of image quality. Animal Infotainment says, Thank you. If I'm not wrong, telecentricity is good for corner image quality and vignetting in ultra wide lenses, but does it also make lenses bigger? No. It doesn't. It doesn't make lenses bigger. Uh, technically, micro four lenses also adopt telecentric optical design, and micro four lenses are all very, very, very small. <laughs> Vermi says, I joined a camera club this year, right when it almost tore itself apart with politicking and infighting. I know, right? Like, people just don't get along. Like, I just want to have fun. I just want to take up take a camera out, go out and just enjoy photography. Like I don't want all this drama, right? Like, seriously. And and I get dragged into this drama. Like and honestly, I didn't do anything wrong. Like I was innocent, right? But just because, oh, I was hanging out with this group of people, the other people were jealous and they say, like, you know, it's oh man, I just don't want to get into details. It's just so sad, right? I could I could get away from all this. The great Vanzini, hey, how are you? <laughs> Good morning, Robin. Good morning to you too. Same here about clubs. Yeah, this is nasty, right? Nasty people. Hui Williams says, your view on follow clubs echoes mine. Toxic and childish snobs infest them. I know, right? Like, why people just don't get along? I just want to go out and enjoy myself. Like, I don't want all this drama. Like, seriously. Estrom says, hi, Robin. Hey, how are you, Estrom? Nice to see you here. Always interesting to watch your lives and videos. Thank you so much. Have you ever tried the old Leica Digilux 3 for thirds camera? No. Well, anything with that Leica, I, I have to be honest, I cannot afford them. Even in a used market, it's like, look at the price, man. It's, it's not feasible. I'm not living that kind of lifestyle where I can afford that Leica camera, right? I'm just being truthful. Bokat86 says, Hi Robin, hey, how are you? Love your videos, thank you so much. I just got a used EMR Mark III and looking at your videos to set up my camera. I have two questions. Do you use primes on your jobs or do you keep changing lens or two bodies? Thank you. I use primes for my jobs. Most of my jobs, not all. There are some jobs where I use the 12 to 40. Depends because I know some situations I cannot change lens. So the zoom lens definitely gets the job done. But if I have no issue changing lens, then prime lens all the way. I used to shoot with two cameras. Uh, one I'll attach a wider lens, say the 12 f2. The other one will be a 45 f1.8 or 25 f1.2. Uh, depends on the jobs that I'm doing, right? Or one with 825 and one with uh, telephoto lens, for example, 40 to 150 Pro or 75 f1.8. I used to run with two cameras, but I find that switching cameras is just as cumbersome as switching lenses. And I've come to a point where I was quite efficient and I was very quick in changing lenses. And I don't miss shots. And I know there are times I need to change lens, so I do it. Uh, so these days, I run with one camera and one prime lens. Of course, all the other prime lenses are in the back. And I can just change them, change them very, very, very quickly. But in the beginning, I used to shoot with two camera bodies. It's just, it's just so hard to handle two, two bodies. 
carrying one body is so much easier, but that doesn't mean I only bring one camera body to the shoot. I always have a backup tip for professional photography. If you haven't already done it, or if you're starting out as a professional photographer, always have a backup. Have a backup camera, have a backup lens. I'm not saying two same cameras or two same lens. Like for example, I'm shooting with 12 f2, 25 f1.8, 45 f1.8. So my backup is the Olympus 12 to 40 f2.8 Pro. You get what I mean? So I have a 40 to 150 f2.8 Pro as my main lens. My backup is 40 to 150 R the tiny plastic lens. Always have a backup because if my main, any one of my main lens fail, none of it has failed before. I'm just saying that they cannot fail. There's always a chance for something bad to happen. You always have a backup. <laughs> have a backup strategy, guys. Yeah, trust me. I've seen all kinds of things happen. They have not happened to me yet, but it doesn't mean it won't happen. So I just have to be prepared. If everything fails, at least I can tell my client that, hey, I've done my best. I've prepared and you know, things still happen, right? Instead of like, oh, sorry, I didn't do anything. Stewart says, I got accused of cheating once at a photo club because I used Photoshop. I know, right? Like this, man, it's just so, it was just so ridiculous. Terry says, the LX100 was odd. It was advertised as 17 megapixels, but only effectively 13 megapixels, yeah. I think the LX100, it doesn't utilize the full sensor. It is true, it uses a 17, megapixels image sensor but then because it has a multi-aspect ratio so it sort of like has different kinds of crops around the sensor so it gets a little bit complicated Animal Infotainment says Leica cameras are now basically Panasonic cameras with a Sony sensor the magic is in their lens yeah that is true Terry says, Leica can be cheaper try a Leica T with Sigma lens with 31.4 but then again that also cost me say in Firemark 3 with like five lenses. <laughs> Animal Infotainment says, what is your opinion on super zooms? I think Micro Four Thirds is a perfect system for super zooms. What do you mean super zoom? 40 to 150 f2.8 Pro or 100 to 400 f4 to, sorry, it's like f5 to 6.3 uh, lens. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we, we can use a few more longer zooms from a micro four thirds system, definitely. It couldn't hurt, right? Savan Freeman says, Robin, could you please share your thoughts on the 25 f1.8 versus 25 f1.4? <laughs> I have a story, but I'm going to sip my coffee first before I tell my story. Wow, this brings back memories. 25 f1.8 versus uh, 25 f1.4. In my early days of blogging, I think it was my first few reviews, I received the uh, 25 F1.8 Olympus uh, to do reviews, right? And then back then I did like part one, part two, part three, part four. So after I did my part one, which was all the important technical things like sharpness, uh, bokeh, chromatic aberration, uh, distortion, whatever, right? My normal review with a lot of sample photographs, I asked my viewers, or sorry, my audience, that time it's a blog, not YouTube. I asked everyone, what would you like to see in part two? So I get like dozens and dozens of requests asking me to compare with the Panasonic Leica 25 f1.4. Okay, fine. So I found, I borrowed the 25 f1.4 from a friend and I went out and compare. So in my conclusion, I was very clear that my comparison was done on the Olympus OMD EM1. So some things may not be valid. If you have these uh, lenses used on the Panasonic body, you may get a different result. So I was very upfront about this. I tested both lenses on the EM1. I don't have a Panasonic body. I don't have the money to buy a Panasonic camera body. And then in my conclusion, I said that the sharpness are very close, but I find that the 25 f1.8 was slightly sharper. The corner softness of the 25 f1.8 was better than the 25 f1.4. That's at least from my testing. And uh, the bokeh quality of the 25 f1.8 is better than the 25 f1.4 because the 25 f1.8, it is smoother. It doesn't have onion rings. Uh, the sides, it doesn't swear, the swivel or swirl. Whereas the 25 f1.4, if you shoot wide open f1.4, the sides, the corners, the edges, the bokeh actually swirls. Right? In terms of chromatic aberration, especially if you use on uh, the 20, 
in the Olympus EM1, if you use the Panasonic 25 2, 2.4, the purple fringing is actually very bad. Whereas the Olympus 25 4.8, the purple fringing is actually better controlled. But this could be due to camera's uh, software correction, right? So that's one, one, one thing. I mentioned that it could be due to software correction. I said it in my review, in my comparison. And also I found that the Panasonic 25 f1.4 is not exactly 25 f1.4 it is actually closer to 25 f1.6 in terms of light gathering capability because i shot at exactly same iso uh, same shutter speeds it seems like you don't get f1.4 versus f1.8 it's more like closer to f1.6 so i published this comparison out with my honest findings and man i was attacked left right center front back by panasonic fans man these lumix fans they are nasty and i say robin all the things you say is invalid i love my 25 f1.4 everything you say is false like robin you don't know what you're talking about you obviously didn't use the 25 f1.4 properly you don't know how to take a photograph robin you are a terrible photographer your review is invalid oh i got attacked so badly that i had to take down that review so that post will never see the light of day ever again and ever since that day ever since that incident i have vowed never to do any direct comparisons ever again a lot of people have requested hey robin how about the olympus 25 f1.8 versus the 25 f1.7 pencil hey robin how about the 15 f1.7 versus the 17 f1.8 hey robin how about the olympus 12 uh, to 40 f2.8 versus the panasonic 12 to 35 f2.8 no i'm traumatized enough i will never ever do because Whatever I say, I will lose. If I say Olympus is bad, the Olympus fans will attack me. If I say Panasonic is bad, the Panasonic fans will attack me. Either way, I cannot say anything bad. It's just, I lose. I don't gain anything. And here I am going out, spending days and days and days, compiling all the shots, scrutinizing, putting them side by side, and trying to compile everything together and make like a, a full review comparison. Being attacked like that, while I was being 100% honest, no, man. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that ever again. So, sorry, I know this is a very long answer to you, Savant, but if you want the, the truth, I've already said it, whether you want to accept it or not, but moving forward, no more comparisons. And Trick says, my mentor said, if you don't have two, you don't have one. Sometimes things fail. That is very wise. Your mentor sounds like a very, very, very wise person. Eric says, the only gripe I have with Micro Four Thirds is not much has improved since my EM5 Mark I to my OM1. Maybe four extra megapixels about it and I, so you can take the same photos then that you can now. That's not true. From EM1 Mark I to uh, EM5 Mark III or EM1 Mark II, there's a huge jump, not just in terms of image quality, you get at least one stop improvement of dynamic range and high ISO, but the autofocus has improved so much. It's like it jumps leaps and bounds. And of course, the electronic viewfinder is better. The 5S image stabilization is so much better. You can handle like 10 seconds, no problem. And you get 4K video recording. You don't get it in EM5 Mark I. Yeah, there's like so much improvement. I disagree with that. But if you say that from EM1 Mark II to the OM1, you don't see much improvement. I agree. That's what I've been saying all this time. Animal Infotainment says, I mean the ones like 12100, 12 to 200, and 1440. All right. Yeah, now I get what you mean. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm not a fan of these super zoom lenses because I'd rather have two lenses, like say um, 12 to 40 and then 40 to 150. Uh, even the kit lenses say 12 to 32 and then 40 to 150 are. I'd rather change lenses. I don't want super zoom because when you have such a massive zoom range, there will always be some compromises there and here. Either the wide end is, is a little bit soft or the longest end is a little bit soft. Terry they say some long telephoto 400 millimeters over primes would be good. Yes, we need longer lenses. Hey, like why aren't they? You, you see, it's like OM system is trying to push like we are the wildlife. Yeah, we make cameras for wildlife photographers. If wildlife pros should use micro filters, but where are the long lenses? We need more, right? <laughs> Jose Lopez says, hey Robin, hello again from Mexico. How are you? Hey Jose, how are you? Very, very, very happy to be here. 
Terry Day says, I have the 25 F1.4 Mark II on OM1 and it does purple fringe. It does! And when I mention that, people just want to rip my eyes out of something. Like, man, seriously. And Trey all says, Robin, you know us penny users are opinionated. <laughs> I know, right? Xmeda says, there is also a nice affordable Panasonic 25 F1.7, bought it a couple weeks ago and I'm happy with it with EPL6. Not as cute as the 45 F1.8, but still small and light, portable sharp. Yeah, the only thing about that Panasonic 25 F1.7, and this is the truth, you can search it out, I'm not bashing Panasonic, right? It has uh, focus shift issues, meaning that as you change to say from F2.8 to F3.5, and the autofocus sort of like goes a little bit off, maybe it's a little bit back focus or front focus, whereas if f1.7 is sharp and if you go to f8, f11 is sharp again. So if you stop down the aperture, you'll get like a little bit of focus shift. And I think that's a manufacturing defect of that 25 f1.7. Isa Isaiah says, hi Robin, hey Isaiah, could you please suggest a vintage prime lens? No, no autofocus, no go for Robin, you must be new here. <laughs> Why don't you consider micro four thirds lenses? They are not expensive. They have full autofocus and they produce excellent results. I just find myself not, I just don't want to go through the trouble of manual focus. Life is too short for manual focusing. I mean, I go out there, I just want to focus on the story that I'm telling. I just want to focus on the subject content, my composition, the lighting. I want to focus on getting that decisive moment, how I convey the, the, the emotion, right? How I convey the message through my photograph. And all these things take a lot of brain power. I don't want to use my brain power to, um, to, to turn the, that manual focusing ring. It's just, am I in focus? Am I in focus? Like, it's just, waste of my brain power, right? So no, no autofocus, no go for Robin. Animal Infotainment says, I don't mind sacrificing a bit of image quality for the flexibility of a super zoom. Depends on what you want to do, right? There are things that the super zoom cannot do. Like for example, you cannot do macro. For example, if you're a macro photographer, you need a macro lens. Uh, you cannot go ultra wide because some people do landscapes and still need an ultra wide lens anyway. And you can't do, for example, uh, say uh, you want to go like super, super, super telephoto, you will still need a 100 to 400 lens for that particular case, right? So it may may be like a jack of all trades, but yeah, it's convenience, but you're trading off a lot of things. And I, I generally shoot with prime lenses and I, I want to shoot with prime lenses because I get that bright aperture f1.8 or f1.4, which I need to use in low light situations or I want to blur off the background, which I can't really do with the super zooms. So there's just too much compromise for me. But I'm, I'm not speaking for you, I'm speaking for myself. But if convenience or flexibility is something that you really treasure in what you do in your photography, then of course the super zoom Zooms will definitely be a good solution. Thorim says, what is your opinion on the Olympus EM1 Mark II? It's awesome. I've talked so much about EM1 Mark II. You must be new here. Just go to any of my videos. I've talked, like, I've made like 10 videos about EM1 Mark II. I will still be making more videos about it. It's my main workhorse. I use it to shoot for my professional jobs. It's my main cameras now. And the OM1 is my backup camera. Xmeda says, interesting with that focus shift on 25 f1.7. Now I have to test it, but mostly it's used on the with 17 f f1.7 to f2.8. Yeah, as soon as you move away from f1.7 at f2.5, f2.8, the focus shift starts to happen. So if you stay with f1.7, it's perfectly fine. And Trick says, hey Robin, didn't I recently see a manual lens review from you? It's the body cap lens, right? Or uh, was it the... Brighting Star 35 F0.95. It's because it's F0.95 and Olympus or OM system or Panasonic, they don't have F0.95 lens. So I will only test a manual focusing lens if it has a specific special features, like something that Olympus or Panasonic do not have, right? Like whether it's wider or whether it has like two times macro or whether it's, uh, yeah, or super cheap or it's F0.95, right? Or super bright. I have a super chat from Entrick. Hey, thank you so much, Entrick. You're so kind. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, 
there's no Robin Wong without the support of you guys and you guys being here, all of you, it means the whole world to me. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and every single contribution from you guys, super chat, buy me coffee or, or uh, donation to my PayPal, it really helps me. They all help me to continue making more content because every single video, whether you realize it or not, it requires resources. I'm using my own funds to make these videos and some of them can be quite costly, right? <laughs> So yeah, even going live here, like just gonna name a few things, microphone cost money, the light cost money, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things here, uh, the HDMI setup cost money, uh, a lot of things, all the LED lights surrounding here, all the accents, they all cost money, right? And I've been doing some improvements to the microphone, I added the arm, I added the dead cat, I added the floater, I added so many stuff, and all of them cost money. And they all come from you guys. You all made this possible. So thank you so much, Entrick. You're helping me to make more contents for everyone. So yeah, you guys should be thanking Entrick as well. All right. Brian says, I just want to ask if you are using 100 to 400 lens with 1.4 two times teleconverter, will the image stabilization work with the teleconverter? I'm asking because most of the micro four thirds has 1000 millimeter max for image stabilization. The stabilization stabilization works further than 1,000 millimeters. I think you are referring to the uh, manual info input. Like let's say if using a manual lens, you have to tell the image stabilization in body what uh, focal length is that lens so that the camera can stabilize that lens optimally, right? Because the camera doesn't communicate with manual focusing lens. So that's why there's a 1,000 millimeter maximum. But there is no maximum, it works with any focal length. Now, having said that, the 100 to 400 lens has lens built-in image stabilization. So that further improves the image stabilization at the longer end of the lens. So even if you attach the teleconverters, you still work. However, there is a penalty. If you go to the official product page of 100 to 400 lens, or if you go to my review of the Olympus 100 to 400 lens, which I've done before, you go to my video, if you can go to the official product page and read up about the penalty of image stabilization, if you attach a teleconverter, it will reduce the effectiveness of image stabilization. Now, I can't remember in my mind what the numbers are, so I don't want to just simply tell you the numbers here. I can be wrong, but there is some penalty. It's about one to two stops. Go and read it up. Let's say that the, the original combination, it has four or five stops of st uh, stabilization. Once you attach the two times teleconverter, you will lose two stops of stabilization. Be very, very well aware. And as you go longer, you need more stabilization, but you lose effectiveness. That is a fact. Uh, do check out the website for official information, or you can dig, it, dig up my old 100 to 400 uh, review if you want this information. Savan says, got it, no more comparisons. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, didn't mean to scare you off. Can you then please share your thoughts on a much wider Olympus than 25 on the, actually, how much wider the 25 1.8 is? Thank you. How much wider? 25 f1.8 is 1.8. It's not any wider. I'm just saying that the Panasonic uh, 25 f1.4 is more like 25 f1.6. It's not really 1.4. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Jen Garcia says, Hi Robin, I just came here today to say I'm cooking some chicken and potatoes to Canary Island style. Best food to combat camera fanboy drama. Oh, thanks for dropping by, J Jan. I appreciate that. And nice to see you here. I hope you're doing well. And that chicken and potato still sounds really nice. Jerry Hukari says, Hi from Finland. Hey, hey Jerry, how are you? Minus 12 degrees Celsius, five and a half, half hours daylight. Oh. That sounds really, really cold. <laughs> I just met up with Mati Sulanto today. We had a photo walk and um, we had lunch. It was a nice catch up session with Mati. Hui Williams says, I love the 14 to 140 so much that I have two of them. They are my most used and grab and go lenses. The first was bought on a G6 kit 10 years ago and the second on a G7. Both bodies saw two weeks ago. Yeah, I think the 14 to 140 is a great lens. I think all these super zooms, they do really well. It's just that they cannot do the specific things that I want, say, for my prime lenses or my macro lens or my ultra wide angle lens. Like, there are situations where it's just not wide enough, so that's why I use the 
the f1.7 in really dim situations i just need the f1.8 bright aperture which unfortunately the super zooms cannot do it's just personal right like we all do photography differently like i'm shooting things that you may not be shooting and you may be uh, doing things that i'm not doing so we all use different lens for different reasons and that's perfectly fine as Trump says, I once had an Olympus 500 uh, f8 reflex lens. Well, wow, it's a mirror lens. Very interesting. Focusing was challenging, so I found a good deal on a Panasonic 100 to 400 and got that instead. Yeah, I think the Panasonic 100 to 400 is an excellent lens. Uh, not too expensive, and you get that crazy 400 millimeters reach. Animal Infotainment says. I thought the focus shift would be compensated by the larger depth of field. Is it that bad? No. The focus shift only happens at certain apertures. So at f1.7, there's no focus shift. If you go to f2.8, f3.5, f4, you gotta test. Some lenses are different. And maybe even f5.6, there's focus shift. And you come back to like maybe f6 or f7, then the focus shift disappears. It happens in the middle range, like f2.8 to f4. That's when it happens very, very clearly. And it's at its worst. And you come back to f5.6, f6, then it slowly disappears. Scott says, you have praised the 45 f1.8 and 12 to 40 pro leaving out the advantage of the extra stop on the prime are the lenses equal or if there are a reason you still would choose the f1.8 i would still choose the f1.8 mainly because i do deal with a lot of low light situations so from f2.8 to f1.8 that is like if i have to use iso 6400 on the f2.8 i can get away with iso 3200 or lower on the f1.8 lens you get what i mean and that is the big difference in micro four thirds world. I know some people will say that, ah, but you can clean it up in, you know, like Topaz or uh, DxO Prime or any of this uh, AI noise reduction software. But you got to remember, it's not just about noise and sharpness. You're losing dynamic range as well. Like there's less for you to recover. There's like, if you're dealing with difficult lighting, let's say I'm shooting on stage, there's like harsh uh, stage lights and there's plenty of like deep shadows. I need to pull up details from the shadow. I need to recover details from the highlight. So if I'm shooting at ISO 3200 or lower versus 6400 or higher, noise is one problem, but I'm also able to recover more details. There's more dynamic range. It could be like extra one to two stops for me to work with. And there is a lot. People don't talk about that when they review softwares, right? Yeah, they just talk about, oh, I don't see noise anymore. It's a miracle. It's like I'm turning in my micro filters cameras into full frame cameras, but there are other things that you have to deal with. Like one of them is dynamic range. So a lot of the situations I'm dealing with harsh dynamic range situations and I'm also dealing with a low light. That's why the F1.8 it really helps if I can keep everything below 1600 ISO perfect I don't have to worry about you know not enough dynamic range or too much noise or anything so that's why the f1.8 will always be advantageous when it comes to 12 to 40 I have to admit the 12 to 40 lens is sharper than 45 f1.8 but sharpness is not everything when it comes to image quality and my clients don't pixel peep anyway right but if I can get away with the 1240 of course I would just use the 1240 if it's a studio shoot with all the lights and I'm staying with ISO 200 I'll just use the 240, right? <laughs> Hui Williams says, I have a Lumix 100 to 300 and its manual focus string is so stiff that it's totally unusable. Then just use autofocus. I think the autofocus is super, super fast, right? Jen Garcia says, I'd love to see a camera brand make a new camera with less bells and whistles, but still give superb image quality and stripped down simplified shooting interface. You're describing Leica but you want a cheap Leica, right? I want that too, right? Just give me like two dials, one to control aperture, one to control shutter speed, uh, just a very basic menu, like one button to control ISO, and then uh, one, uh, and then in the menu, I can control the, 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 the white balance, and then the autofocus, I can only, I, I can live with just maybe nine points autofocus, I'm happy with it, right? I'm perfectly happy with that. And just a very basic camera with a viewfinder, I'm set, I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very nice suggestion, Jan. We have another super chat from Hui Williams. Thank you so much, Hui Williams. Hui says, I appreciate your economic situation, which affects so many others, professional or enthusiasts alike. Yeah. Thank you so much for understanding, like, especially us in Malaysia. Hey, we don't earn as much as other photographers in Europe or European countries or in America, where in United States of America, where you can charge like $10,000 for a wedding. Like here, you charge like... 5,000 ringgit, which is like, I don't know, less than 
1,000 US dollars. You charge 1,000 US dollars for a wedding and people are like screaming, wow, that is really, really, really expensive already. So the amount of money that we earn here is a lot less as a professional photographer because people here, average income is also a lot less. We just have to adjust. We can't just command a ridiculous price. So thanks for understanding the situation. Hui Williams, I really appreciate that. And that super chat is just uh, contributed. It means a whole world to me. It also means that I can continue. I can assure you that I can continue Continue to make more videos in the future. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. All right, uh, time check. It is almost 11 o'clock. We have been live for two hours and there's like 95 of you here, 98. Wow, there's almost 100 people here concurrently. I'm gonna keep myself hydrated. I'm gonna drink some water and then I'm going to uh, yeah, drink coffee and then we'll continue with the chat. <laughs> All right. Ah, uh, yeah, I gotta stay hydrated. Hey, can't afford to fall sick and uh, sip more coffee. Ah, uh, coffee is life. Okay, before I continue on with the uh, comments, replying to comments, uh, I would like to continue on with my remaining points on how for thirds DSR system has impacted the photography industry, right? So just now we have talked about telecentric optical design, where the lens design is optimized to squeeze every little pixels from edge to edge, right? And then we've also talked about uh, four thirds cameras, Olympus introducing in camera, in sensor, self cleaning the dust reduction where everyone else copied now. And Olympus also introduced in the four thirds camera, the E330, first live view in DSLR. And now any DSLRs or any mirrorless cameras, any professional cameras, they also have live view. Now there are one very important thing that Olympus has pushed uh, in the early days of four thirds. They didn't invent this, they didn't start this. I believe Minolta started the in-body image stabilization in a digital camera. So it wasn't Olympus that, that started this. Uh, and then also, of course, Sony in the DSRs, they also have in-camera image stabilization. Pentax also had in-camera image stabilization. It was Canon and Nikon that pushed the lens-based image stabilization. So everyone else besides a Canon and Nikon basically used in-body image stabilization, but it was four thirds and it was Olympus that really pushed and showed what is possible with in-body image stabilization. And the in-body image stabilization in, uh, in the earlier bodies, like for example, this E520, uh, this was launched in the year 2008, E520. It already has a powerful image stabilization in body sensor based, right? And of course, subsequently in the flagship cameras like uh, E3 and oh, not this, it was the E5. This was launched in the year 2011, E5. Of course, this has very powerful in body image stabilization. And of course, uh, this paved way to the micro four thirds system, Olympus continue on to push what the image stabilization is capable of. That's why we have the incredible five axis image stabilization. Now it all originated from these four thirds cameras, right? It was the four thirds DSLRs that have the in-body image stabilization. It was Olympus who really pushed and championed and really, really popularized the use of sensor shift image stabilization. And I don't have to tell you how impressive and how capable our 5S image stabilization is in our Micro Four Thirds EM1, EM1 Mark II, Mark III, or the OM1, or even like the newer Panasonic bodies, the G9, the G9 Mark II, we have impressive 5S image stabilization. It all started from the Four Thirds system. And it is game changing. I think I wouldn't be able to use for my professional shoots a camera without image stabilization. That's because since my earlier days with my Four Thirds system, it has shown me how, how useful and how important it is to have a powerful image stabilization. And since then, I just need a powerful image stabilization in any cameras that I use, right? And another lesser important thing, but still, they started this trend. Olympus in the four thirds days, they started in the E30. This was before Instagram. 
they started art filters. This was way before Instagram existed. It was way before Instagram introduced all these filters that you can apply all this uh, vintage or this artistic filters look in, the, in, in your photographs, right? And of course, when Olympus introduced the art filters, people laugh, laugh at them and say, ah, no one's going to use these filters. Photographers prefer to edit their own photographs, right? But, lo and behold, soon after, Canon, Nikon, Sony, everyone has some kinds of creative art effect or filters in their camera. Every single camera has them. <laughs> and it all started with Olympus. It seems that Four Thirds, or at least Olympus in the Four Thirds time, had the foresight of seeing that, hey, this art filter is going to be a thing. And they were the first one to start it. It all started from Olympus. So yeah, they, they push the image stabilization. They also push the, the art filters. And we have another super chat. Uh, let's go to that. Wow. Square Dot. Thank you so much, Square Dot, for the super chat. Uh, thanks for all the help with my Micro Photos adventure. You do an awesome service with your channel. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to share as much as I can. I'll share as much tips and tips tips and tricks and all I want is for you guys to enjoy photography if I can help you to understand your camera a little bit better if I can help you to use your camera a little bit more effectively I'm very happy to do so so the uh, the super chat or any contributions will enable me to continue to share as much as I can so thank you so much Square Dot. thank you thank you all right let's continue on with the chat where were we Vermis says, I bought the Brighting Star 0.95 on the back of that review. Always looking for fast lenses in this dull climate. So you have that lens now. How do you find it? Is your experience using the lens, do they match with what my reviews were saying? Do let me know. Hey, if I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong, right? And it's also very important. Like, One of the things about reviews is that maybe like all these manufacturers that are sending me the best samples, which may not be representative of the production unit or production uh, or the other products that's out there, right? So if you find anything that is different from, from what I, I talk about in my review, please let me know. I will be very happy to, to address this issue, right? I'm not always 100% right. Isaiah says, I have the Pan 20 F1 point, Panasonic 20 F1.7, which I could not let go despite its focusing issue. Do you think it is still good to buy the Olympus 17 F1.8 or buy the Panasonic 15, which makes more sense? Really like the 35. I personally prefer to use the Panasonic 15 F1.7. Uh, this is just personal. I think the Olympus 17 F1.8 is an excellent lens. The Olympus 17 is sharp. It has a nice bokeh. The focus is blazing fast, but it's just there's something about the rendering that I don't like. It doesn't look natural. It doesn't look true to life. There's something weird about it. I don't know. Maybe it's due to too much software correction. I don't know. But the Panasonic 15 f 7 the rendering looks more natural, it looks more pleasing to me. At least if you're asking me to comment on both of these lenses, right? But the Panasonic 20 f 7 is an excellent lens, but I also admit that the focus is quite slow. Xmida says, Super Zoom is nice main lens, and then you just have some primes in the back, so in case you see Superman flying around, you can catch him. <laughs> and once you want perfect picture, you switch lens and take time. Yeah. I, I think you have the right idea there, and the prime lenses are so tiny, right? You just fit them in, in your camera bag without taking much space. The great Vanzini says, As my eyes seem to have grown older, the, the rest of me, autofocus has become a must. Yes, it has become a must for me too. I cannot live without autofocus. Terry says, Why not OM1 and new firmware? It's been quite a while. Surely they can improve a few issues like tracking without subject detection, which has been criticized. I have no idea. And every time they release a software update or firmware upgrade, it requires quite a huge amount of resources. That's, at least that's what I understand while I was working for Olympus. It, it, it consumes quite a lot of resources. So they can't just make uh, an upgrade with just minor improvements, right? I think they are putting in maybe some significant improvement. We just have to be patient and trust that the, the OM system, all these solutions, they know what they are doing. Ivan says, I occasionally like busting out some old Minota glass on my EMA Mark III. I do use focus peaking, but still get soft motion images. Any tips or settings you recommend? My tip would be not to use the focus peaking because focus peaking is just an estimation. It gives you a very rough estimate of where the focus is. 
I would highly suggest that you use Focus Magnify. You magnify the area that you want to be in focus, magnify at least five times, and then you manual focus, and then you grab the shot. And in my latest video, one of the two, two weeks ago, I think, when I reviewed the uh, Brighting Star 35 f0.95 lens, I can achieve almost, almost all the time, I think 90% of the time, tax sharp focus, even shooting at wide open f0.95, by using Focus Magnify. And you can assign one of the buttons, any of the buttons as a shortcut to quickly press for Focus Magnify and you can just quickly magnify to, to get that paint sharp uh, focus. KH uh, L452 says, you're the best Robin, thanks for the videos, no worries, you're too kind, thanks for the compliment. Squeda says, Hi Robin, thanks for helping me make informed decisions and teaching me how to navigate my camera. No worries. I'll continue to share as much as I can. Thanks for the super chat. I appreciate that. Gigi Wildlife, hey, how are you? Nice to see you here. Hello Robin, I hope you are well and in good health. Happy December to you. Thank you so much. I'm doing quite well. I hope you are doing well on, on your end. Kelvin Ong says, Hi Robin, I have the E1 Mark II, 12-40, 40-150 f2.8. Now looking for a backup camera, should I buy the E1 Mark II or Mark III? Thanks. I think E1 Mark II and Mark III are very similar. E1 Mark III, you can benefit from, uh, I think, handheld high resolution shot, which I think a lot of people find it very useful. You can get like 50 megapixel images handheld. Uh, you also benefit from uh, face detection autofocus, which is a lot more reliable in comparison to EMR Mark II. And oh, one thing though, in-camera charging and power delivery. I don't know if it's a big deal for you. To me, it's a big deal. I just plug in a USB-C charger and charge the camera directly. Or if I'm using the camera, say like now, I'm using the OM-1 for this live stream, I can plug in a USB cable for live uh, camera power delivery without having to worry about the battery running out. I cannot do that with the EM-1 Mark II, but I can do that with the EM-1 Mark III, right? So there you go. Uh, it depends if these things are important to you. If they are not, then EM-1 Mark II is still a great camera. Same autofocus performance, same image quality, you know, almost the same image stabilization. Skoda says, can you do a review of the Lumix G100? I don't think that camera gets a fair evaluation. I couldn't find one even if I want to. I'm, there's no way I'm going to spend my hard-earned cash on a camera because it doesn't add anything to what I'm doing. So I'm, of course, if Panasonic is willing to loan me one, I'll be willing to review, but it seems like Panasonic is quite non-existent in Malaysia so far. I don't hear any activities promoting the G9 Mark II, for example. I will attend a user touch and try event for the G9 Mark II if there's any, but there's none. So yeah, uh, I couldn't get my hands on one. Louis Bodenstaff says, Hi Robin, hey Louis, how are you? With my EM10 Mark III, when using a Lumix 14 to 45, which has lens image stabilization, does overall, does overall stabilization improve or does the camera image stabilization overrule the lens IS? Thank you. There is an option in the camera for you to choose whether you want to prioritize the lens image stabilization or the camera's image stabilization. You cannot use both. You have to choose one. By default, if you haven't changed the setting, then it's a camera's image stabilization, stabilization that is prioritized. In this case, the EM10 Mark III's image stabilization in camera is superior if compared with the 14 to 45 lens. However, if you have a longer lens, say 100 to 300, 100 to 400 from Panasonic, the lens stabilization may be more effective than the camera because as the lens goes further away from the camera, when it's too far away, that, that furthest part uh, is very hard for the camera to stabilize. So having that uh, stabilization inside the lens will definitely help uh, you much better than the, the camera. Only if you use very long lenses. But in your case, a 1445 on the EM10 Mark III, the EM10 Mark III stabilization works way better than the lens. Trust me, oh, or you can test it. So you can enable, go, go into the camera settings, find uh, the priority, IS priority lens or, or camera, uh, turn off the lens, use the camera or set it to lens and you can take photographs and compare, see which one is better. I think that way you, you understand the camera a little bit better. All right. And Trick says, Robin's next cat will say coffee is life. <laughs> you know, if you're putting ideas to me, maybe I'll, I'll probably just do that. 
The Great Vanzini says, Used my G100 last week. I was surprised how good it was. All right, that's great. Vermi says, I haven't received the Brighting Star Lens yet. It might not get here until January. Wow, that's quite long. I'll drop a comment on the review video. No worries. Looking forward to your feedback. Sylvan says, what I meant is that the Olympus 25 f1.8 is a little wider than older 25mm lens. It seems to be more like 24 or 23. Do you notice much of a difference when using it? No, I, I think it's 25 as 25. I don't think it's much wider. When I compose, it reminds me of using a 15 millimeters lens. So maybe it's a little bit wider, say a 24, like what you said, but it's still equivalent to 48. 48, 50, like if you're telling me I can see the difference in that two millimeters, well, I must be a genius. So no, I still treat it like, like a 15 millimeters lens. Huey Williams says, I have a 20 OM system f1.4 and a Sony A7 Mark III for a low light and a flash, both a small standard one for EM1 and a bigger chip flash for Panasonic and Olympus Rear 14, 114, not appropriate. Yeah, that's true. But there's also like carrying a lot of uh, different equipments, right? If I, th I thought the reason you are going for the 14 to 140 is also because you just want one lens to do it all. You're not going to carry other lenses. If I were to carry two or three lenses, I probably will not carry the 14 to 140. Yeah, but that's just me. Like I, like I said, I'm not speaking for everyone. Uh, this is just my preference on how I choose and, and, and strategize for a photo shoot. Gigi Wildlife says, Just before I joined you, I was playing with my GH5 Mark II with a 16mm lens. I forgot it had it as my go-to in EM1 Mark III, but the video on it, which I originally used for wildlife, is exceptional. Yeah, the 16mm lens is awesome. That's like the best macro lens you can get out there. Like, no question asked. Rebirth 2526 says, I recently learned to love my EM10 Mark III again. I just learned manual focus and use focus picking. Thank you to your video. Yep, if you are okay with the focus picking, if you get the results that you need, then yeah, go for it. Hui Williams says, the autofocus on the 100 to 300 works fine most of the time, but not so hot at the 300 end for focusing on ships at sea, for instance. Oh, okay. I thought the ships don't move very fast. Why is that the case? Using the 100 to 300 on which camera though? Hmm. Byron Gonzalez says, Good morning, everyone. Hey, Byron, how are you? Nice to see you here. Rebirth says, EM10 Mark III does not have IS parity. Mark II has this option. Really? Interesting. I didn't realize they removed this feature. Interesting. Okay. Byron says, Do you believe that G100 is relevant in 2023? I don't have the G100. And I know that the G100 doesn't have image stabilization. And I just mentioned earlier that I cannot live with a camera without an image stabilization if I were to buy a new camera. If I'm using an older camera, that's fine. Like if I were to use a GF2 or a GH3, for example, I know that they don't have image stabilization, but these cameras were around for more than 10 years, so I can forgive them, right? But any cameras today, if I were to buy new with no image stabilization, it's a big no-no for me, at least for me, right? It's a deciding factor. Joe Preet says, Hi Robin, just listening. Hey Joe, how are you? Nice to see you here. Hope you're doing well. Gigi Wallaf says, Sorry, I meant the 12 to 60 lens. Yeah, 12 to 60 is a great lens. Definitely, definitely a good lens. Very good range as well. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna sip some coffee here and drink more water. Hmm. There's currently 101 viewers. Concurrently. That's a lot of you, and I've caught up with the comments. Wow. For the first time, I remember I was always like 20 minutes behind in my comments. <laughs> and today I finally caught up with the comments. That's amazing. Hmm. I'm just going to finish. No more coffee. I'm just going to down with some water. All right. Hmm. Hmm. Ah. All right, just gonna sum up my thoughts on the four thirds impact on the industry. All right, uh, the five things that I've mentioned earlier, the uh, telecentric optical design, which was copied by everyone, and then the in-camera sensor cleaning, which is also copied by everyone because it's so important, it's so useful, right? It's so effective. Uh, and then we also have live view, 
which is also copied by everyone. It changes the way we take photographs, uh, which I personally use a lot more these days, uh, live view versus the electronic viewfinder. It's 50-50. Uh, and then we have the image stabilization also changes the way we shoot, right? And we are more confident in hand-holding our camera. And I also seldom carry tripods anymore. If, if I need to use like one to two seconds shutter speed, no problem handheld. And then of course, there is the art filter, which Olympus or Four Third system has used it way even before Instagram existed, which is amazing, right? Uh, I think Four Thirds over that, that span of about 10 years, starting from 2003 and sort of got discontinued in 2013, 2014, uh, in that 10 years existence has contributed so much in the industry, you know, and all these features that I've mentioned, they changed the way we shoot photography. They are actually making really, they even changed the way the manufacturers design the lenses where we get more optimized results and we enjoy photography more because we get to use the electronic viewfinder, uh, which is what's basically a live view. <laughs> of course, all these, features, all these advancements got uh, translated or got ported over to Micro Four Thirds, which continued to push the boundaries of imaging. And that's what we get to enjoy today. So I think Four Thirds has contributed a lot to the industry. I just want to celebrate their contributions here and just say that I really did enjoy using Four Thirds DSLR. I thought they were excellent. And of course, uh, modern technology came and uh, mirrorless is definitely the future. Olympus and Panasonic saw that. That's why they went uh, Micro Four Thirds and now we are enjoying what the micro four thirds have, have given us a lot of small and capable lenses and a lot of amazing computational photography features ai for example focusing uh, the bird detection of focus in om1 is excellent and we get all this amazing like handheld high res shot pixel shift live composite live nd all the amazing features right so all this originated from the four thirds and i just want to say that four thirds was really really awesome and receive a super chat again HR Manro, wow, two super chats. Like, oh man, that's not necessary, but man, thank you so much. You're so kind. Thank you, Hesha Manro. Yes, enjoy more coffee. I, I will get more coffee. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Scott P says, uh, Industry impact thought, has Olympus returned to classic body styles with the OMD and Pan F reduced ugly body styles from other manufacturers? Yes, but uh, the classic body styles, I wouldn't, attribute it to just Olympus because someone else did it first. It was Fuji, right? Fuji started with the X100 and then uh, they really start to push their retro look, although they didn't really have their own style to copy. They technically copied Leica anyway. It's a cheap Leica knockoff design, but still they were pushing this retro look with all the manual dials and everything. And then of course, then, then Olympus copied the OM uh, DSLR, sorry, OM SLR design and a Pan uh, SLR design from, from back in the day in the OMD and the Pan F, right? So yeah, that's one of the interesting, interesting thing that they did with the Micro Four Thirds camera body. Gigi Wallaf says, my go-to Wallaf setup is my EM1 Mark III and the Panasonic 100 to 400. Awesome. It just blows away this setup with images are breathtaking to say the least. Yeah, EM1 Mark III is just an excellent camera, amazing image quality, and that Panasonic 100 to 400 is an excellent lens. Very nice pairing there. All right, Asmila says, do you think that Olympus or OM will reintroduce lenses like 90 to 250 or 35 to 100 or 50 to 200? Let's hope they do. I think there's some something in the telephoto range that's rumored to come out and the year is ending and we haven't heard anything from them. So I don't know what's up with that. Um, well, maybe the rumor is not true, but I think we can use longer lenses and that's where Micro Four Thirds shine, right? They make longer lenses and they can make it really, really small and compact and optimize image quality. MP says, which Micro Four Thirds camera would you recommend for hiking? So light and weather, weather sealed. If you want weather sealing, then the EM5 series camera. Maybe the EM5 Mark III or the OM5. Smaller and lighter, so it doesn't... Of course, the EM1 series is more rugged, but it's also heavier. So if you want to carry it as light as possible and still have weather sealing, then the EM5 series camera or the OM5. Jari Huikari says, I ordered a prism ball. Interesting to see if I get new effects with it on my photos. Yeah, give it a try. I think you can add some creative touch to your photographs. Hesha Manro says, I said I didn't have any four third gear, but I realized I do have an Olympus FL600R flash. Wasn't that a four thirds flash? I uh, know, FL600R was released during micro four thirds, if I remember correctly, not four thirds era. At that time, we already have an EM5 or EM1. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong. It's not a four thirds gear. 
Gordon says, hi Robin. Hey Gordon, so sorry I'm late. No need to apologize, man. I'm so grateful that you are here. I'm so grateful that it's like 100 of you here. So no need to apologize, man. Uh, but wanted to say hi at least. So hi, hi Gordon. Just a bit after seven here and miss your start. Agree with your summary of impact. No worries. You didn't miss anything really. And it's, it was just me. Uh, revisiting a nostalgia of me, the earlier days of my photography career using the Fortress DSLR. It's just such a joyful time. And I do think that the Fortress DSLR was really capable and I did really have a fun time. I got so many fantastic shots with them. So yeah. Defense Dad says, Hi Robin, hey, how are you? Thoughts on the Panasonic GS8 in 2023? I've been considering picking one up. Seems like a fun camera. As long as the camera has 16 megapixel sensor, I think it has any Panasonic or Olympus Micro Four Thirds camera with 16 megapixels onward, they have way better image quality than the first generation 12 megapixel image sensor, and the autofocus has improved so much as well if you have more modern features. So I think GS8 is a fantastic camera, go for it. I think no regret whatsoever. Alright, Gigi Walaf says, my go-to macro setup for nature is my EM10 Mark II with the 60 macro lens. I love the flip screen for this rather than the articul articulated screen and 16 megapixel is more than enough to gr uh, a great lightweight setup. Yes, I agree. That tilt screen is so much better than swivel screen if, if I were to do photography. But unfortunately, I'm also doing YouTube videos, so I need the swivel screen, like now I have a swivel screen in front of me so I can see myself while I talk to you guys, right? So, yeah, you just can't have both, unfortunately. And I'm not rich enough to buy like, oh, one camera to do video and one for photo. I, I need like a hybrid camera that can do everything, right? So it's, it's like, yeah. I, I, can, I can understand why the tilt screen is better for photo. I agree with you, but I also need the swivel screen to do videos. <laughs> As Strom says, I bring my OM-1 with the 240 f2.8 and the Panasonic 100-400 when hiking. Less than 2 kilograms total weight. But some people may want to keep it even lighter, like, you know, maybe less than 1 kilograms. And if that's the, the case, then maybe the OM-5 or EM-5 Mark III with a kit lens, say, maybe uh, 12 to 45 Pro. Yep, there will be a or something that's a lot lighter if possible. Or even maybe the older 12 to 50 f 3.5 to 6.3 that's also weather sealed uh, that's a very small lens very light also weather sealed right to keep the size down and weight down of course in this says gsx lumix is 20 megapixels even better <laughs> right I'm, I'm saying that if it has the 16 megapixel sensor and later yeah so if it has the 20 megapixels even better yeah 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 Terry says, I think OM should update the F1.8 lenses with weather sealing to match the bodies. Yes. I'm also waiting for the update, right? Some of the lenses are more than 10 years old now. I think the uh, 45 F1.8 is definitely more than one, more than 10 years old and could definitely use an, an upgrade. And I want to see like 12 F2, 17 F1.8, uh, 25 F1.8, 45 F1.8, and 75 F1.8. I want to see all these lenses weather sealed. If they can make a 60 f2.8 macro where they're sealed. Like, why can't they make all these other lenses where they're sealed? And they don't have to be pro lenses, right? You see the 60 f2.8 macro lens is not a pro lens. And it's priced very reasonably for what it can do. It has the ceiling, it has amazing optical performance. Like this one of the best macro lens out there. So I think like adding weather ceiling to all the other lenses, it may bump up the cost a little bit, maybe 10, 20%, but I can live with that. You know, I do shoot in rain. I, I don't know if you guys have seen some of my videos, like sometimes I get trapped in the rain so having that weather ceiling on my prime lenses and i do use the prime lenses a lot it can really 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 help <laughs> yeah i definitely agree with you <laughs> time check it is uh almost 11 30 uh it's half past 11 i think it's, and yeah we've been chatting for two and a half hours we'll see if there's any more comments uh if you guys have any questions or anything you want to ask me, I'm here. The reason why I'm doing live streams, I've been consistently doing live streams for the past two months. And I just want to make myself available because I can't reply to every single comment on my videos. I have hundreds and hundreds of videos on my channel already. I'm still getting comments in my videos that I made like three years ago. And I, I just can't trace every, I have hundreds of comments every day. I can't just go to every video and reply. It's just impossible, right? So
else. I'm missing out a lot of your comments. So I'm doing live stream here so that you can come on live, uh, have a chat with me and ask me any questions or you have any comments here. And I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to you and happy to answer your question the best that I can. If you haven't realized, I have not skipped any question or any comment here at all. I go through every single one, right? Yeah, and um, we'll, we'll go on for maybe another 10, 15 minutes and we'll, maybe we'll call it a night. As Strom says, I have the 12 F2 and I bought it in 2013. Yeah, I think 12 F2 is an excellent, excellent lens, right? And it's more than 10 years already, right? We could use an update. We could definitely use it. I remember they did something really bad with the 12 F2. So they launched the silver version and then they never had a black version and then because the black lens is like becoming popular because Olympus has a lot of black bodies at that time the top bodies like EM1 they're all black right before they produce the silver version and people just want to match the black body with black lens and then they launch the 12 f2 black version limited edition and charge extra for that and people were going crazy like what the hell you know it should make the black version like normal price give it like silver or black version same price right so they make a mistake Mistake from the beginning, charging extra for that black limited edition, and after that, I think like 25 f 1.8, um, 45 f 1.8 onward. After that, they have like black and silver version without charging extra. <laughs> they learn from the mistakes. Gigi Walaf says, Robin, in your thoughts, do you think Olympus or OM are busy making a newish camera? I hope they do. They better make a new camera and better make a wow camera, right? If they want to survive. Defense that says, right now my favorite combination for every day is my EM1 Mark II with my Panasonic 35 100 f2.8. Works well for most of what I do. That is an excellent combination. And that 35 100 is so compact, right? And you still get like bright aperture f2.8. A very, very nice combination. Terry asks, Robin, have you used the Panasonic 12 f1.4? Yes, I have. And I've done a full review for that lens. You can search Robin Wong, Panasonic 12 f1.4. It's out there somewhere. It was published on Ming Tian's blog, so it was written, or the review happened when I was contributing to Ming Tian's website. Uh, the review is up there, you can read my full thoughts on that lens. I think it's an excellent lens, but it does have some issues. And I tested that lens on a Panasonic body. If I remember correctly, it was a GH4 uh, or G9, I can't remember which camera, and it still has some problems. like. Purple fringing, it has this really weird purple haze. When you're shooting against strong source of light, like the entire image is just soft. And that purple haze is just very disruptive. That's my only complaint. Other than that, autofocus is fast. The image quality is excellent. It's very sharp, very nice bokeh. Uh, the lens is a little bit on the larger side of things, but yeah, it's, it's a great lens. But I don't think the price is a bit too high though for what it is. Joe Pritt says, FL600 and FL300R work fine with more recent cameras. There are very few limitations, even going back to Olympus Premium Compact Cameras, FL CB05. My only issue with the FL600R is that it's not powerful enough. Even for my macro shots, you have to remember for my macro shots, uh, I'm using the wireless flash. I have a diffuser, so it cuts down the light to maybe, uh, it cuts down 30% of the light through the diffuser. And then I'm using very narrow aperture for sufficient depth of view, right? So if I'm going to go for full magnific magnification, which is equivalent to 200% magnification equivalent, uh, then I need like F8, F11 that further cuts down the light. And I want to stay at ISO 200. So I find myself using full power and even so, it's not powerful enough. So that's why I need like uh, FL50R, which is like double the power of FL600R. And I find myself, even so, I'm using the FL50R, sometimes shooting at half power or one third of the power on the flash. Yeah, FL600R is just not powerful enough. And I don't like the buttons on that, that flash. It's a little bit fiddly and that dial, that rotating dial is very annoying to use. I still prefer the older style of controlling the flash, just the buttons on the FL50R. This is just my thoughts. But of course, the FL600R is weather sealed, which the FL50R isn't, right? Gordon says, how do you find the OM5 for a video? I actually just realized you're using the EM5 Mark III, but largely the same. Both seem to work with Panasonic lenses. Yes. Okay, you have two questions. How is OM5 for video and working well with Panasonic lenses? Yes, the EM5 Mark III, I use it for most of the videos. I think well, now maybe about 70-80% of the videos see on my main channel. Uh, anything you see in the past two years, they were shot with the EM5 Mark III. 
uh, except for POV videos. POV videos, I was using an action cam. So everything else, my standing talking headshots, it was EM5 Mark III. So I think the video is actually excellent. Uh, and I use Panasonic lenses. I have three Panasonic lenses, four now, but three actively using. One uh, is the 9 f1.7 for all my wide angle use. Sometimes I need to go wider, like group shots or shooting in tight spaces or location shots, establishing shots. I need wider shots, so I use 9 f1.7. Panasonic excellent lens. I also use it for my vlogging. Uh, if you see my second channel, I use the 9 f1.7 a lot. And then I also have the Panasonic 15 f1.7, which I use a lot for my street. And I also use the 15 f1.7 a lot for my video making. It is my second lens. I only use two lenses for my video making for my talking headshots, the usual videos, like sharing tips and tricks or talking about camera lens reviews. Only two lenses, 45 f1.8 for my talking head so I can get like nice blur background. So you get compressed background, less background to see, right? A flattering low proportionate head and body, 45 f1.8. And for close up, for everything else, for my B-rolls, I actually use the Panasonic 15 f1.7, which is an excellent, excellent lens. I've been using that lens for like two years now, for, or more than two years making videos just these two lenses right small compact easy to use and they get the job done uh, they all work really well I have no issue whatsoever and the third lens that I have which I recently added uh, but I haven't revealed this to anyone yet is the 100 to 300 lens I will talk about this very very soon and it worked very well on my OM1 or EM1 Mark II no issue whatsoever I have a recent job which I need that length my longest lens is 40 to 150 and 150 is not enough and i know that particular situation i can't uh share my details about the shoot all i can say is i need that reach so i needed 300 millimeters so in between the olympus 75 to 300 and panasonic 100 to 300 i found the panasonic at a used market in a very good condition a very good price i cannot resist so i got the panasonic 100 to 300 for that particular job and it did a fantastic job and I got the shots that I needed, right? And it worked really well on my cameras. I hope that answers your question, Gordon. Xmeda says, it would be nice to see some Olympus at Z3. Ah, yeah, but that's not four thirds, right? Not micro four thirds. Now similar cameras are almost gone from the market and it's almost no competition, just like OM update of Z2. I think it's because, yeah, smartphones just took over everything, right? So there's not really a, a demand for a small size sensor compact cameras anymore. Jopri is talking to H.R. Monroe. The Nissin flashes are just designated four thirds and they work fine on micro four thirds. That is true. And Godox also have micro four thirds flashes as well and they are new. Jopri says, I use the SDF 8 for macro. Yeah, but I need like, yeah, the, the effect is different. It's just different. <laughs> Meridian says, micro photo impact the way I do street photography is just amazing, but also you make great impact on us. Thank you for sharing knowledge and perspective. Thanks for the comments and thanks for the compliments. I really appreciate it. But uh, the impact that we were discussing earlier, which I have concluded anyway, just to be clear, it's not micro four thirds. It was four thirds DSLR, which was like this beast here, which is this E1 uh, DSLR. And a lot of they have like E3, E520, E30. And of course, this is a DSLR lens which is the 1454. This is four thirds DSR before they went mirrorless uh, into micro four thirds. Yeah, we were discussing about the impact that it had on the industry. And so like celebrate and acknowledge what they have contributed, right? Pinnacle Pete, hey Pete, how are you? Nice to see you here. Pete says, hi Robin. Since everyone copied Olympus Dustbuster, articulating the rear screen and image stabilization, why can't OM Solutions copy the best continuous autofocus and tracking and eye detection that Sony is doing? Yeah, maybe because Sony is not sharing, right? And all this articulating screen, image stabilization, they can develop the technology or reverse engineer them. It's, it's so easy, right? Uh, even the sensor shift or uh, the, the dust uh, reduction thing everything is easily recreated or redesigned by else someone else they can just do it themselves the technology is not that hard it's just the idea that olympus or photo started it but the autofocus tracking algorithm the ai algorithm maybe sony is not sharing with everyone else maybe they're just keeping it to themselves even canon and nikon they have their own algorithm and i think canon's is doing really well it's not too far from what sony can do of course sony is better but nikon is still quite far behind fuji is still quite far behind of course om digital solutions is quite far behind <laughs> all right yeah let me just uh drink more water feeling a bit thirsty hey and there's like 95 of you here online that's a lot of you hmm
Uh, there's some police car in the highway, script with a siren screaming. I don't know if you guys can hear it in the background. Oh wow, that's getting really loud. <laughs> Brian Gonzalez is asking, is it true? M4E3? Micro Four Thirds? I think your question is a little bit cut off. Anyway, I'm going to read the next comment until you retype your comment or your question. Hernan says, Robin, here Hernan, your bro in Mexico. Hey Hernan, how are you? Very nice of you to drop by. Nice to see you here. Thanks for new great talk. Always necessary. Please, some words about effort and focus for Antonio. Some Fred with personal problem. A little bump life. Antonio? What, what about Antonio? Is your friend okay? What happened to, to him? Some words about effort and focus. Yeah, I, hope, I hope he's doing well. Let me know what do you want me to say to him. I think, yeah, for me, it's just if you're down in your life, just pick up a camera, go out and take more photographs. I think that will make your life a little bit happier, right? All right, Byron says, micro photos suffer in low light photography. That's not true. Uh, what is true is that Larger image sensor formats, for example, full frame, uh, which has like four times the surface area of image sensor if you compare micro four thirds, you have definitely better low light performance. You have high ISO shooting with less noise. That is true. But having said that, I've done a lot of jobs in low light. You can search in my YouTube channel, just type low light. Uh, I've shared a lot of tips and tricks on how to use micro four thirds in low light. I've also shared plenty of jobs and photographs, actual jobs that I did, which I delivered to my clients and was paid to do so. Shooting in low light where I need to use the ISO 6400, 12800. And I delivered those photos to my clients and you can look at my photographs where I shared on my YouTube where I blow it up to see 100% view. Uh, no issue whatsoever. I think micro four thirds, I confidently shoot ISO 6400 and I use f1.8 lens. I can do a lot in low light with, combined with the powerful image stabilization. If I'm dealing with subjects that are static or moving very slowly, I can lower down my eyes and just trust that the image stabilization will stabilize my hand holding of the camera, right? So with the powerful image stabilization, I can use ISO 6400 or even higher, no issue. I've proven that in my previous videos. And with bright aperture lenses like f1.8 or f1.2, if you can afford them, no issue whatsoever of shooting in low light for me. As Mira says, we want that police chase video. <laughs> oh man, I'll get into trouble chasing the police here. And then you'll see like, if I don't go live next week, you know why I'm in jail. <laughs> Terry says, the Z8 and Z9 are level with Canon and touch behind Sony. I've used them and the hit rate is impressive. But the Z8 and Z9 are also like, Z8 is already costing twice, asking the asking price is twice of what the OM1 is asking for, or the G9 Mark II, and the Z9 is like three times. So yeah, considering that they are behind Sony and Sony is asking a lot less, and Canon's camera like the R6 or you know like R, R5, sorry, not R5, R6, right, or R7, they're asking a lot less compared to Z8 and Z9, that says a lot about Nikon, right? Yeah. <laughs> Time check is uh, 40 minutes past 11, or the correct way to say it's like 20 minutes to midnight here in Malaysia. And I've caught up with all the comments. So I think it's time to, yeah, to close the chat, uh, to end the stream. So thank you so much guys for staying with me until the end. I appreciate that you stay with me for almost three hours. That is really impressive and yeah. Uh, some plans moving forward. I do have a video that I will publish next Monday. Uh, very excited to share the video with you guys. I'm not gonna spoil, not gonna give any spoilers, but it's a POV video. I'm going to the streets to shoot. Always nice to bring you guys along with me and see what's happening in front of me. Uh, yeah, that will be great. That's happening next Monday. And of course, there's another live stream on next Thursday. I haven't decided what topic I wanna talk to. If you have any ideas or suggestions on what, uh, topic to talk about in live streams, please let me know here in the live chat or in the comments later when the live chat ended. Uh, I'll read your comments. I'll definitely take your suggestions if it's awesome. Yeah, you'll see me talking about the topic in the next live stream. Uh, anyways, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the super chats, uh, those who have contributed. And if you have enjoyed this stream, if you have found my sharing beneficial, please do consider buying me a cup of coffee. The link is up here or in the description down below you can click on the link buy me a cup of coffee or you can contribute directly to my paypal 
Any contribution goes a long way. It'll definitely help me to continue making more content and publish them right here and do more live streams, engage with you guys, and love you guys. And please, please, please go out and take more photographs. I'll do the next one. Bye-bye.